to you live from Miniac HQ, where we have Oompa Loompas working in the back tirelessly making content for you day and night is the podcast known as Trapped Under Plastic. You know, it's that one podcast you put on sometimes while you're listening in the background to some music while you're painting. That's not at all. <laughs> that's not at all what he wrote. I, I got nervous. <laughs> Why'd you get nervous? Because Vince is right here, clearly. Yeah, that's it. Looking Welcome, over your shoulder. Vince. Thank yep. you. I'm very excited to show people the real Vince. Yeah, it's I about know. to happen. The dirty Vince. <laughs> the one who the one will backstab you, you know? Yes. <laughs> Not this facade he puts on the internet where he's like, oh, you know, I just share all the info and I'm perfect and I paint all the time. No, he's a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> it all sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> it all sounds right. Welcome, Vince. How are you Matt. doing? I'm great, buddy. It's good to be here. I'm excited. Mm. Uh, today is, as we're recording this, today is the launch day for Space Station Zero for my new game. Mm. Uh, okay. You can put a counter up for that plug as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying yeah. it a lot, as well as the number of times I say the word sure. Yeah, mm. okay. We're absolutely getting a sure counter going. Absolutely. But yeah, you are here showing off a new game that you're making. Why don't you give us like the short like description of it? Yeah, sure. So Space Station Zero is a uh, sci-fi miniatures agnostic uh, survival skirmish game. Uh, it can be played solo, co-op, uh, or versus, head-to-head -head mode, as it were. Mm. And it's all about uh, you taking a crew of whatever uh, brave and or maybe cowardly and or dastardly uh, spaceship uh, peoples into the heart of an ancient and dark and mysterious space station trying to uncover the mystery. Mm. Of what spaceship the peoples. Center and whether or not you can escape. And find your way back home. Okay. We're going to talk more about that later because yeah. we've already talked about it and looked at the rules. And I have a lot of comments that are like really cool uh, details about the game that I want to talk about. But yeah, he is here showing off his new game. You can find it linked down in the description for now. And we're going to chat about it more later. But first and most important, the preamble ramble, John. Preamble ramble. John's right. favorite part of the podcast. And it's the only part of the podcast worth this listening to. This is the part to. where John carries his weight. <laughs> 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 we got stories, guys. We got stories. I want to say before we get into the preamble ramble, this is the pre-preamble ramble for veterans of the podcast, where I want to, on the screen right now, Alex, can you show a picture? You probably already showed it, but now you're going to feel awkward and have to show it again. The picture of the art of the cover of Space Station Zero, because this is fucking sweet. Yeah. Vince showed me the book today, and I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. This yeah. is a real, this is like a real game. Yeah, yeah, that was your first comment. Yeah, as if Vince would like scam people with a fake game. <laughs> you just open the book, it's all blank pages. <laughs> yeah. No, yes, that, that cover is done by, uh, as well as uh, the vast majority of the interior art is done by Will Kirkby, uh, who is an amazing artist. Uh, you can check him out on uh, Instagram and all that sort of stuff. And he's a really great artist, works with Critical Role and stuff like that. So we were very lucky to get him. Mm. And he his style and aesthetic was just perfect for this game yeah yeah so it was great he was awesome yeah i just assumed that like i'd open the cover and it would be like a elisa elisa frank folder with just bright pink unicorns and stuff but it was actually a real book so yeah yeah I, it wasn't a pop-up book that's what john was hoping for <laughs> he was hoping to pop it up just next pictures week. oh yeah okay i get it does it come with stickers uh We'll, we'll make merch with stickers. The book doesn't come with stickers. You're dead to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> we need a sticker for the door. We've actually been having a huge amount of, Adam and I have been having a huge amount of sticker conversation recently. Really? Like, wow. Yeah, really. Okay, That's okay. Not, it's not a joke. Wow. Okay, so actual preamble ramble now. I got a couple things to talk about. Uh, the first one, we need to circle back around to the soundboard update. Mm -hmm. So I put a poll out on the Facebook group, which if you're not a member of the Trapped Under Plastic Facebook group, what are you doing with your life? Um, or if you just believe that Facebook is a cesspool, that's also an appropriate response. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go through a, a lot of a lot of people added their own ideas on here, um, but I'm just going to go through the top couple that got the most votes, and you guys give me your your kind of your your responses to these. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, uh, the number one vote getter was the Metal Gear Solid alert sound. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be on there, right? Absolutely. Because it's my idea, so everyone is going to vote for it. When you make the poll, I put that one in. Yeah. Also, I'll put the next one in. Which, uh, no, I didn't put this one in. The Price is Right loser sound. What is that one? Bum, bum, bum. Uh, no. Is that right? Bum, bum, bum. No, that's the actual theme song. I don't fucking remember now. It's something along those lines. Same composer. Are we Are we big game show boys here? You didn't watch boys. You didn't watch a lot of yes, prices. We're, we're right all game show boys. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's like a soy all boy, but uh, a I don't watch a lot of game shows. But like, wrapped under plastic, the podcast for game show boys. 
we got our next shirt idea. <laughs> it just says Game Showy Boy. <laughs> yeah, I, I watch a ton of game shows. Do you guys watch them or no? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. As a kid, you know, growing up and stuff, like Price is Right. If you ever, they ever canceled school, or you're homesick from school over lunchtime, have your little Campbell's chicken noodle soup and watch Price is Right. Mm. Under, Hundo P. Yeah, that's like, that's that life. <laughs> If if and to this day, you could go home sick right now, Scott, and you can watch Prices Right. It's on Monday through Friday. It's an institution. It is. It is an institution. Okay, the other ones that are high vote getters here: Tim the Toolman Taylor. <laughs> Sound? <laughs> <laughs> you remember that song? Yeah, the show. <laughs> you did a pretty good job right there. <coughs> one, it was that was pretty good. Two, eh. yeah. <laughs> response to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next one: the Final Fantasy success jingle. Don't know it. Okay. Bum 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 bum. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, that's good. That's we just defeated sure. the the monsters. Sure. Get our XPs and our guilt. You know what's weird? I play miniature war games, which is inherently turn based, but I fucking hate turn based video games. I think wow. it's the worst invention ever. Wow. Wow. That's the entire country of Japan. You just lost like <laughs> yeah. off the list. They're not I listening mean, to this anymore. I get it. But you know what I mean? Like when I'm playing in an analog world, I'm gonna live by its limitations and its restrictions. And I'm gonna play in a digital world, I want it, you know, hunt you know, hundred millisecond latency. I want it like fast, snappy, you know, that's the whole point for me at least. I understand, yes. You're the people that ruined video games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. Really are. now everything is uh, it says action whatever the genre it is yeah. it says action in front of it yeah that, that gets me that just sells to me hit all the buttons oh yeah yeah you got the reason we can't have a, like a just a simple monkey island anymore you know oh, we no, can't just no, be a, no, no. A, a, a a brave little child exploring a fun world and using tools to try to crack things that like, sounds terrible yeah, yeah. exactly it, it requires <laughs> someone just added fart noise right i mean that's not bad uh next one here emotional damage <laughs> i mean Slightly racist, but, I mean, it's a good one. He is Asian, so he can say it. So I don't know if we get a quote from him saying it, if that makes it okay. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, next one here. Get Vinci V to record Here's Why You're Wrong for the soundboard. All right, Vince, let's have a moment of just clear airways for you to say two things. One is her. The other is here's why you're wrong. All right. Take it away. Sure. And Scott, on your opinion we talked about earlier, here's why you're wrong. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, got those in the bank. The deep Morbius cut. Um, yes. Scott's tongue slapping sound. We don't need to hear that right now. <laughs> and those, those are, are all the noise. Those are all the top vote uh, vote getters. Those are words. Um, I thought of one on the drive home last time. That um, I don't know if it's a bit of of like internet history. Uh, still a piece of garbage. Oh yeah, like that, that would be like oh, when my. it's a self deprecating thing. The big part of the soundboard is you have to think of the the instance of when. Yeah, sure. Why are you it. hitting the button? Why yeah. are you hitting the button? So when I drone on about something stupid for way too long, Scott can just not respond and just say, "Sure." <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that's my cue to move on. Yeah, yeah. Which would definitely come in handy very often. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, I see what we did here. I have more preamble ramble stuff. No but before, comment. Before I uh, go through my uh, second preamble ramble thing, I'm going to open the floor to the to the audience here. Do either of you have preamble the, rambles? Who are the fucking audience in your fucking show, dude? <laughs> well, thanks, John, for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate it. I just need to have a couch. Um, so, Vince, this, you, this is your inaugural top and and hopefully not the last finally visit of uh to top so yeah, i've never as, watched it before what's it like yeah it's trash this is this is pretty much the pinnacle right now yeah. <laughs> um do you have any preamble ramble anything interesting happening in your life any uh uh you know uh, observational comedy you want to share with us any jerry seinfeld moments or what's the deal <laughs> no yeah, yeah honestly no this is uh, i'm very happy to be here this is in the middle of a lot of travel, so everyone can see this contextually. I spent last weekend in Nashville, then I drove all the way back, and then I had to fly the next day to Houston for my normal work, and I was there uh, for the most of the week, and then I got home, and then the next day I flew here, Dang. and I'm here for there and the, the, this over the weekend, and then I go home, and then I'm home for two days, and then I go to Nova. Go to Nova on Wednesday. Yeah, so, uh, so my wife is very nice. Uh, everyone should tell Kathy thank you. Thank you, uh, Kathy, Kathy, for taking care of the dogs. Yes, absolutely, for... Yeah. for 
for solo parenting our three dogs. Yeah. Holding it down. Yeah, she is. But but no, I mean, like, I, I don't have any fun stories. I'm just excited to be hanging with both you guys again. I miss you guys. Yeah, yeah we miss you too. We do. This is, this is going to be fun, just hanging out, chilling, painting, doing silly stuff, eating unhealthy food. That's oh really gosh. all the boxes we need to check. Yeah. <laughs> I will forego any preamble ramble because I have a feeling that this is going to be a longer episode. Okay, okay. So, so I will you, go on to my part of the preamble ramble, which is story time with John. And in this episode, uh, I sure, turned sure, I sure. turned <laughs> <laughs> I turned forty last weekend as of the recording of this. Yes, congratulations! And thank you. I I made it. Welcome I didn't know. I didn't well. think I'd make it this far. I made it. Um, and so the day of my birthday, uh, I went to a local convention, gaming convention in La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is a little over an hour drive. So I woke up early in the morning, went with a couple of buddies and we went down there and they had a miniature painting, um, aspect to it, mm. which is pretty cool. It's a very first year they did mini painting. Nice. Um, and so I walked around all, all that and I got to see some minis and I got to talk to a couple of the the artists that were hanging out by their minis. And there was one gentleman in particular who won best in show that I asked him if he's going to bring his stuff to um, Adepticon for golden demon, Mm. because he was good. And his large piece was a commission and it was the, like the forge world scorpion thing, the big, I don't even know what faction it's for, but it's like a, a robot scorpion. You're talking about the Necron thing? Yes. Okay. He take he he was commissioned to take that and to turn it into an orc salvaged like war machine. Nice. And so there's orcs from the um uh Oric War Clans. What are the ones why can't I think of the name of it? The ones that you play. Swamp Bogglers. Iron Jaws. Iron Jaws. No Swamp Bogglers present. <laughs> and so the thing is all <laughs> is all beat up, rusted out. It's got all sorts of stuff hacked onto it and like duct taped onto it. However, orcs make their shit and they're riding it like a chariot. And it painted very well and just very cool. I'm like, this is a spectacle piece. This needs to make it to, sure. to Adepticon. So that was pretty cool. There was a, a ton of vendors there. That was pretty cool. They had a silent auction. I went and looked at all sorts of stuff. I didn't bid on anything because you had to be present when it ended if you bid. And I was like, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be back at my house tonight. So I couldn't, I didn't bid on anything. Blame. Um, but there, the reason, one of the reasons I went is one of the, the goody peepees, um, Jordan, invited me. He had a booth there. He's a 2D artist and he's a miniature painter as well. And he invited me to come. And so I got to meet him, hang out with him a little bit, see all of his art. And he entered the miniature painting competitions. I got to talk to him a little bit about that. Um, and he also gave me a giant box of snacks to bring back. Okay. I brought half of them here. I half ate, of them. I ate the other half. Someone sent us, uh, Roberto Gomez sent us a giant box of Mexican candy, and I brought them all home and didn't give any to you. <laughs> I'm like, I haven't had any Mexican candy. <laughs> yeah. I haven't had the sweet and spicy. <laughs> yeah, we ate like 5% of it, so I'm going to bring it back for you. Don't worry. Oh. But uh, yeah, we have even more candy. Oh my God. Mm. Treats. Anyways, what were you saying? So she, you'll say there's a giant pan of scotcheroos out there. And mm-hmm. you'll be like, gosh, John, thanks for bringing the entire pan of scotcheroos. Well, that was a double decker pan. It was two layers. I ate one layer in the last week. <laughs> wow. I Yourself? was in, you no, know, my daughter and my wife probably had two each. Um, <laughs> you fucking man. I had child. 20. <laughs> so I've, I've been like pretty healthy. Lately, over the, over the summer, with a workout regimen and eating really healthy, and then my wife and daughter were gone for a trip. And then you just steered the Titanic right into that ice cream. Right, and, and I've been downhill ever since. Yeah. So we're ordering three pizzas after this. Yes, I true. mean, yeah, it already happened. Um, the pizzas are coming. Yeah. I actually do have a preamble ramble topic I want to okay, talk about. Okay, go for it. Okay, in my constant mission to play more 1v1 board games and miniature war games, I played a little game called Black Rose Wars by Ludus Magnus Studios, an Italian brand. Never heard of it. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it either. Uh, kind of clunky rules-wise, but really cool concept. Did enjoy playing it. It just wasn't like the smoothest like gameplay experience, but it wasn't like that. That wasn't a detractor. I would still play it. But anyways, I was looking through the models, and I recognized two of them to be... The exact characters from uh, Chimera's Kickstarter, Fate of Asteria, like Tenembre, Fate of Asteria. Yeah, sure. Um, 
and but they were posed differently. And then I got out my resin copy and looked at them side by side, and sure enough, they were the exact same character, just reposed. And we always talk about how like companies, we wish companies that made board games that have cool designs would like make like a high quality version of their design for like painters. And no one ever does that because understandably it's not like worth it. Mm. Like, you know, if your target audience is gamers, like why are you going to invest in making display models? Like you're trying to broaden your target audience, but that can get, you know, be a little weird. But anyways, um, I found out that uh, Chimera loaned the characters to Ludus Magnus to be used in their game, which I thought was an awesome idea because you have people who have a board game audience who are making a great board game with board game minis and people who are good at casting resin stuff doing that and making a great resin cast for painters. So it's like that makes sense to divide the work up that way. And I would I would love to see other companies kind of like follow in their footsteps and do something similar. Well, think of how much was put into the my character design, yeah. the 2D art design. And then the digital sculpting of everything. So much work was to make the the characters. Well, they're made. Mm -hmm. How can you repurpose that? That would be sweet to see. Yeah, it always feels bad when you open up a board game and you see the quality of the minis versus like the renders or the art or anything else. Yeah, I mean, because you're right. There's a lot of effort. Like artists are putting in. You look at the character designs, the art direction. You're like, these are amazing. Yeah, these look fantastic. You look at the renders, and and again, you're like, oh, okay, this this is still looking pretty good. And then you look at the actual thing, and you're like, oh, it's trash. Yeah, (laughs) it's Uh, trash. So you know, that's it, it. Feels like we could just ship that same material over to people who know how to properly cast a thing or yeah. whatever and 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 get a better quality product so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was that was a cool little discovery yes yeah. nice that's that's a good look at you preamble rambling look here at me. yeah wow. and, uh, the second half of mine we had a big old i say big old but the sizable party at my house for my 40th birthday with a whole bunch of people over and i grilled out a whole bunch of meats assorted meats mm-hmm um, did my best Ron Swanson impression, and we played games, and uh, we had a Mario Kart tournament. Who won? And I drank way too much. Uh, eventually, okay, we were too drunk, and then t- three of the we had two systems going, so we had eight ga- eight players playing at once. And eventually, like three of the eight controllers, all batteries, all died, and then we were just like, oh, I guess whatever, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and and so we were up till four in the morning. Nice. Playing games and As played a game be. of of Commander Magic the Gathering until four of the morning, and that was fun. So nice. it was a good time. Um, I uh, I had uh, last I checked, I I had more than more beers than I can count on two hands, and I drank too much Fireball. But Fireball is amazing. Okay, yeah. Do you, know, you know what Fireball is? You ever Fireball? Cinnamon whiskey. Cinnamon whiskey. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I, I once watched someone in a David Dobrik video drink an entire bottle of Fireball. Ooh. Start to finish. Ooh. It's a dumb college kid, but it was amazing. That's got to hurt your tum-tum pretty oh, yeah. pretty bad. Yeah, you're hurting after that for sure. Yeah. All right. Anyways. That's that's it. That's the pre- That's all the preamble ramble I have today. We got him. Now let's hear about what we have painted. Vince, kick us off. What have you painted in the last two weeks or one week or whatever you want to share? Well, I just started on a very fun little gene stealer cult figure last night when i got in we we painted for a few hours for funsies for funsies that's just for funsies Mm -hmm. uh that's not for anything uh that was a a gift from from daz so i wanted to make sure it got painted up and it seemed like the appropriate thing it's a sci-fi mini you're you're putting you're putting pressure on me here vince you gave me drica that's a much larger model than than the gene stealer cult model okay get get on it get Get those dry brushes out that much bigger (laughs) <laughs> it's like four times the size. Who cares? You own an airbrush? What is size? Mm. All right, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get a painted. Paint a house. That's true. <laughs> You're painting a house. That's true. What if I painted a Drica with a paint roller, though? I, Do you think Daz would approve of that? I, I One, yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Two, there you go. You got a video. I know, yeah. Just be rolling just right over the top of it. You know, they have those little, like, there's a little dollhouse stuff for everything. I'm sure you could find a little two-scale dollhouse <laughs> paint roller and just use it. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's a great prop thing to have for yeah. a hobby. Oh, like, yeah. Frankly. Yeah. I mean, just in life in general. Right. Just bust out the one-eighth scale paint roller. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, gosh, I got to do all this terrain. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's a great little bit right there. <laughs> you can have it like attached like a tiny doll hand and it's like kind of just moving. <laughs> it's just duct tape to a Barbie hand. Yeah. 
All right, so uh, one GT they're called model, and that's all you painted, right? That's, you don't paint much, right? Not much at all. all right, no. I'm a John. What did you paint? Yeah. <laughs> See, it, this is great. I, I was thinking about this in the drive up. The timing of this is perfect about what we painted because this is like the single week in Vince's last 30 years of life. <laughs> he hasn't painted 40 models in a true. week. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah. You, you guys have literally caught me at my weakest point. <laughs> Strike. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I have a bunch of stuff prepped up to go, but yeah, I mean, just with all the travel and then everything that was going on, I just didn't have any time. I, I literally have had no time to. Wow, I'm anything. disappointed. I'm sorry. I was expecting hundreds of models. I, I, do you want to know what I really painted? I primed, you know, 80 figs and different stuff for my teaching at Nova, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like, because I'm teaching Ugh. a bunch of classes at Nova. So, I mean, that I don't think that's interesting to your viewers. But, you know, that that's the, when you teach, you have to prep everything up and yeah. all of that. I mean. So, it was all just getting ready for this travel because I had to prep for all four trips before I left for the first one because I had no time in between. Right. Who who assembles and primes the models for their students? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not everybody. <laughs> yeah, not everybody. But Vince does because he's that kind of stand-up guy. Um, are you done, Vince? Are you done talking? John, what did you paint? <laughs> there we go. He's a he's a he's a seasoned veteran. I painted this for this week's video, so this will have been out for a little over a week by the time you guys see this. Um, but this was from my uh, try to make my own official Warhammer tutorial video. And so it uses the, the classic battle ready three-step method of base coat shade and highlight with edge highlights mm. for the majority of it. Eventually I lost my fucking mind and John, I what miniature am I holding? This is the Cursling. Thank you, John. Yeah, describe it for the audio yeah, listeners. Yeah, you got it. You got a fucking podcast. Remember host. this is an audio format. Oh, right, right. <laughs> This is a model. Season three. This is a model. 70 some episodes. This is the new. She's talking about. Uh, look, so I painted a thing. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it is the new Kersling model from the Disciples of Zinch faction in the box set. It's the, they have this thing now. Arcane Cataclysm. Arcane Cataclysm. Thanks for remembering the name. You're but up. they have their thing now with Age of Sigmar where they put out these dual boxes, and, and Vince is very familiar with this, where they like to put out one new model for each of the factions that are in there. Oh, bro, is this breaking? Is this sword supposed to be, like, a, like bent like that? What do you mean? Okay, well, like... Give it to Vince. <laughs> if his it's handle is like this, and then the sword is like that. Oh. Yeah, probably probably shouldn't be like that, no? <sighs> Ouch. Okay, I don't want to touch it. I'm scared. It's I don't. Oh yeah, it's definitely bent. bent. Mm -hmm. Just give her a little bendy bend back. I put it in my. <laughs> That's gonna... <laughs> you just break it off. Yeah. God damn. Fixed it. Fucking one hand, dude. You're holding the base with your pinky and your thumb, and you're just pushing that sword back. I'm like, he's gonna fuck that, <laughs> dude. <Boop. laughs> dude. The video is done. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like, that model is dead to me. I uh, all the glamour shots have been made. Thanks, Vince. Thanks for coming on our podcast. Yeah, yeah. Breaking my fucking break? models. <laughs> um, Look, first of all, it was already bent. Mm, yeah, apparently just taking putting it in this double double bubble wrap was not enough. Um, and I painted one other thing, and it's actually a, a gift for the great Kathy Venturella. Um, we were all tasked with painting a, a doggo of that's similar to or the same as our dog's. And so I, I painted this in 30 minutes. Damn. On my, uh, I did a painting video for my patrons where in 30 minutes I painted up the doggo um, and kind of focused on Zenithal, the power of Zenithal dry brush mm -hmm. um, and then contrast and then edge highlight. So mm -hmm. for the three easy steps. It's, he look one. He looks great. Two. I'm gonna pass this to Scott now, so he can be jealous, because your dog is <laughs> so much simpler and <laughs> does There's not. No way have I could have painted Scott's in 30 minutes. <laughs> look at look at the look at the smooth, clean design of this. Look at all that guy. fabric that you got to paint. That's just nice, simple rolls of fabric. Mm -hmm. So I painted um, him like Argus. I painted him as is the the blue color, which is just kind of a cool gray, is the color of their fur. So even though he's not a neo. With that color scheme, he looks pretty close to a Neo. So. You missed a mold line. Uh, I did not. Uh, he was. He came to me somewhat pre-primed, I think. I'm and so I was just too lazy at that point to remove the mold line. Yeah. I don't think Kathy cares, right? No. Yeah. yeah. She won't notice. She, she, she won't even notice. I'm extremely jealous. Yeah. But that he's fun. It was actually the the kinds of minis that are really That's awesome. fun to paint in a quick in a, yeah, yeah. a quick paint job. And the... 
the dry brush Zenithal is legit. Like you can really push where you want it brighter and brighter and then you can kind of keep it fainter so that when you put on the contrast or the thin glazes or whatever. Yep. Um, and so. Yeah. So are you just exclusively dry brushing to get that Zenithal or are you also airbrushing? Uh, so it came to me primed black with a kind of like a weak Zenithal so it was really more like a kind of like a dark gray from the top mm -hmm. low. But I could have done... I wouldn't even needed an airbrush to achieve the same thing. Yeah, for speed painting, that's actually my. This has become. I'm, I'm with you, John. This has actually yeah. become my favorite sort of. I don't know workflow methodology for mm -hmm. speed painting, which is you just go with a dark black gray to start. I never used pure black, but a dark black gray, and then a light zenithal from above through the airbrush. You want to create like some general environmental light uh, and, and you know, call out the volumes and the shapes. And then you just, with a really soft dry brush, you, then you just actually build in where you want the exact sort of light volumes. It For for speed painting, it's so fast to go through it and you can just actually build up a much more intense opacity to the uh, mm -hmm. to the, the much, bright color. Yeah. Uh, with that dry brush. And way faster. Way faster. Yeah. And and then it's also more stable. It re it, like it's not going to reactivate as easy if you happen to have a lot of people have problems with their zenithal of reactivating if they use inks and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah, you just take the any any of a bunch of transparent colors over the top, and it's and boom, yeah. pops your uncle. All the ghosts in my legions of Nagash or sorry, soul black grave lords army. Um, I painted with a dry brush and then an airbrush to soften the look, but the dry brush started out because it got that intense white color, like way faster than like a white ink would ever get over yeah, yeah. that like large, like Palanquin model. Um, uh, but yeah, I should do that more often. I don't do it enough. Scott, what did you paint? I painted two things, um, and I started another thing last night when Vince uh, showed up. Uh, but I painted a character from Dota Two. My favorite character from the game, Void Spirit, another mid laner, just like Fade, the first model that I had sculpted from a MOBA and painted, but in a smaller scale this time. Do you know what these words mean? He knows. I've I've played the game. Okay. <laughs> you say that so depressingly. <laughs> I've played the game. I understand. I did never. the same thing last night where he said English words. Like, I'm <laughs> positive he's speaking the English language, and yet that <laughs> sentence, I, I can look back at it, nothing. <laughs> well... Pretty model. Here you go. Oh, yay. That's pretty the model. We both speak. Uh, and then I painted Asha Greyjoy, um, who is a, an attachment in my song army that I use very often. So uh, I feel like I should definitely paint her because she gets a lot of mileage. And then same thing, I painted another model for Song Wise and Fire that I use a lot, Baron Blacktide. But he's not done yet. Just these two. Oh, Vince broke your spear blade. Did you? <laughs> okay, it's a, it's actually a, probably a super brittle resin 3D prints. So I wouldn't be surprised. No, I'm very careful with Scott's minis. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> yeah. the paint jobs are actually good. Oh, oh. got him, got him, got him. Yeah, okay. I had a lot of fun painting Void. It reminded me when I painted the thing that I call the Forest Revenant, which was like an all green, like hooded weird guy. Um, I used largely green on him, using largely purple. So using a lot of the same strategies where it's like uh, cold purples, warm purples, mm -hmm. or like... Purple nurples. Exactly. You know how like... Say you have like uh, like mauve, the color mauve, you know? Which is like a fancy word for purple. Um, B. Arthur's best show, I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I just said yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can like paint something with like the lower six to ten range of mauve and you can paint something else with the upper one to five range of mauve and it can look like two different like materials but it it, it stays in scheme very well you know what i'm talking about i do i'd like you to say the word mauve about mauve 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 mm, mm. yeah so basically that's a great way to like when you're limiting your hue to like really stretch your color scheme farther it's just to kind of like break things up by adjusting the like the value range of the model, which, sure. I, which I did for that, like his loincloth is a bright mauve, but like one of his robe materials is the same color progression, but just a darker version of it. Move down in the value scale. I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very like it's a, it's a good example of a successful analogous color scheme. Uh, yeah, that was Thank the first you. thing I said to you. Yeah. Um, Got to bust out my hot pink. I have a box full of hot pink fluorescent colors, and I lost the entire box. Um, so I had to go and buy more fluorescent pink paint. 
Uh, but I have like I don't know like ten or twelve different brands of it. Oh, that's right. I was gonna do you like do a, a big test. Yeah, you, guys, a, you collected them all. Yeah, I got them all. <laughs> They're yeah. all gone. They're all gone. I don't know where they are, dude. <laughs> Did you try that dirty down uh, moss on the standing stones here? You better believe it. Yeah, we had a uh, we had a guy in here yesterday. Uh, well, he won John Schaefer who said that it reactivates with moisture. Did, yeah, did you experience re- that? Reactivates with water. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know so that. You can blend it out. You can like feather it out. Oh, nice. And you can, if like, if it gets too intense, even after it's dried for a while, you can go back in with a damp brush. Because I did that on like doing the uh, uh, Conrad Kurz, aka Conrad Cruz. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did on like on his all the rubble on his base. I had moss that was like way too fucking neon green. Yeah. I just went through with water on the brush, and it's like fades it away and so it's like oh man it's like a nice little erasable thing yeah you see like the rocks have like a drippy kind of line texture on them yeah so i used green ink that was thinned down to do that and maybe that inadvertently also kind of like thinned out the mossy color around it i didn't even know that they reactivated it's typically i would do it is the final step in Mm -hmm. my painting process which kind of makes sense for a lot of weathering things anyway usually you do them towards the end yeah but i wouldn't like build layers of other shit over top of this stuff unless you are okay with it messing with what, the effect you've had. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I see a lot of people use the dirty down rust and the problem is they just straight apply it and so you'll get this like area of hyper intense rust yeah, yeah. that then just immediately ends and becomes yes. normal surface and I'm like, oh boy, that is not how rust works. So yeah. Like, you've almost got to feather it out or you can like wash the edges of it with something else or, but you know, you need to, you need to fade. Yes. Rust doesn't just like happen in a giant splotch. Yeah, and, and that's everything around is normal. Like the thicker you put it on, the more layers you put on, it gets more and more intense like that. So you can actually thin it out a little bit with water and like create that like darker stuff, and then towards the inside, build up more layers and get what you're going for. Yeah, but yeah, even then it dries so matte. I still like to use because I use it on my War Dog thing I did. I also then use some acrylic and enamels to create more of that natural transition because. It's pretty intense. Yeah, it is pretty intense. Um, it kind of instagibbed my synthetic brush that I was using with it. Like, oh, yeah, I don't it, use any good brush with it. Yeah, like curled it immediately. Yeah. Um, it kind of seemed like, not exactly like I put my paint, my, my brush through super glue, but it was like, it was kind of like that. Like the, the bristles were kind of a little stuck together, a little curled and kind of mangled a bit. You, um, but yeah, yeah you're use- gonna want to rinse your brush like every time you put a little on. Okay. Rinse your brush brush out because if it dries in there, it cakes on there. Yeah, it's like if you use um, uh, that Tamiya Clear. Yes, that will do the same kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. I love to me a clear. I have so much. I have so many different colors. I use that shit all the time. Um, and then Asher Greyjoy here. I, okay, I learned something recently. There are people out there in the world, and you can sound off in the comment sections below, who just don't paint eyes on figures. Oh, it, this was a huge discussion. Yeah, I, yeah. I know. I okay. I know those people exist. But what I didn't realize was how large of a population they are. Like on my stream, everyone was like. I hate painting eyes, and so I just don't do it. I just put some wash in there. It's like, yeah, really? Didn't you come up 50-50 on your poll? I did. did I was so stream? shocked. I was watching. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I'm, are you, are you in numbers. Team Fuck Eyes, or what, are you, what team are um, you on? At the, at the very least, this still, if you have problems with eyes, you're going to have problems with this. But at the very least, I'll try to do the specular white, just a little dot in, in the corner. And oh, oftentimes, yeah. when they're small enough... There's there's something in the in, kind of around the lids, and then there's that little light, and it's like, it, yep, it's an eye. So I, I do that at the minimum. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm definitely always painting eyes. Like you got to, you got to get in the reps. Yeah. Always. It's never going to get easier if you don't do it. A hundred percent. And sometimes models don't have great eyes. Whatever, make it work. You know, you'll figure it out. Or just only paint Space Marines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, then you can do lenses. Totally different. Easy. I had a, I had a revelation about that in doing my. Um, doing my video in the the GW process, not only about the lack of eyes because you can just have helmets, but think about edge highlighting being one of the things that, especially for a new painter, is kind of a pain, or it's you know you feel like you screw stuff up, or it's the thing that's like oh this I have to really take my time, and people get frustrated with it. Space Marines have so few edges. Are Everything you, are you is joking. No. Everything is cylinders. There are edges because it has to be a, a plane somewhere. Mm. John had a stroke right before this. I think <laughs> I think I would agree with you, kind of, if we were talking about old Space Marines. But, like, the new Primaris in, 
especially have so many panels yeah and circles the little panels and shit i guess in my brain i'm thinking of like classic yeah you know, squat space marine yeah i get it i get the backpack yeah. i get it and that's yet. got a lot yeah but the, the main buy is kind of just like two rings where the cylinder ends and begins so yes. yeah i get what you're saying like all the all the legs all the torso all the arms and all the head everything is well, it depends on how much you want to go into the edges right if you go full like heavier metal then you've got uh, you know the individual panels on the Marines because all sure. the Marines have always had individual panels. Like you have the knee sure. plate, the knee circle plate being separate from the the knee guard plate being separate from the the shin plate and all of that. So if you hit each of those, then yeah, it can get time consuming. But if you're literally just hitting the ones that are edge edge, like true edges, yes. sticking out, then it's not that many. Well, and I, I mean, would compared to like a tank or something. Sure, I would argue that those <laughs> the the original Space Marines too, even as early as probably like six seven years ago. If you look at like the heavy metal paint of paint schemes of those, they are going through and like freehanding those lines because they're not even there on the sculpts. Yeah. Like even on the knee pads, like the whole thing is a, like a mush ball and they put in a V on the top. Mm -hmm. So it's like as a new painter or whatever, you're like, well, there's not really an edge there. Uh, okay, I'm good. Yeah. So I, th I think that this, I, I, this is my tinfoil hat theory. They purposely designed them that way to be like not intimidating. So like how can we make them look cool but still easy to paint? And that's what they came up with. Sure. I would disagree with you. I would say the exact opposite. They did design it in a specific way and it is to highlight their process of base layer edge edge edge. It's like the poster boy of how to paint that way. I don't know to the definition of the new Primaris or what their design goals were, but I mean this is a known quantity. <laughs> why a space marine is designed how he is it, it's this isn't like some secret thing oh do tell okay space marines look like they do because they wanted an iconic i.e a single silhouette frame that would be iconic for 40k to match the chaos warrior that was there for warhammer fantasy which had become uh, the symbolic logo of fantasy after fantasy launched in does look just like those guys so mm. they took the aesthetic design of the the heavy armor and the sort of baroque stylings and then they in, instead of having the more uh angular design of chaos they moved it more to the round design than when they mm. launched space marines but the goal was to have a a similar heavy armored iconic silhouette yeah uh, as the defining uh, miniature of the of the game. Mm. Even the helmet is very similar in shape. Now, mm -hmm. when you get to the front, they change it, but like the whole yeah yeah it doesn't have the big stupid horns that come together with the weird ball in the center. What's up with the weird ball in the center of this Chaos Warriors? You know what I'm talking about? Ornamentation. You mean in between the horns? In between the horns. Yeah, it's usually a skull or something. Like it's like was that because like oh we can't have pokey things where children hurt themselves? Yeah, originally they were yes. Well, no, originally they were there because of a limitation of the the sculpting process. Sculpting process. Yeah. I thought about that back when I had that casting, one casting. I should say casting, casting process. Battle Masters. I, had, I got Battle Masters as a little kid from a, a garage sale, and that Chaos Warrior is in Battle Masters, and I'm, that was Milton Bradley or something. I feel like they stole it from Games Workshop, or Games Workshop stole it from them. Who's to say? This is the '80s. Well, actually, <laughs> ah, got that soundbite. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, <laughs> yes, both Battle Masters and Hero Quest are uh, collaborations between the two. Um, and if you go back and read the individual lore in those books, you'll see they're actually using sort of proto fantasy lore. So, for example, uh, they often will refer to the Barbarian or as Sigmar, um, because oh, and uh, other characters. They'll, they'll, the, there are many, many characters in the world. Uh, most of Hero Quest, for example, is happening within the the what would become the borders of the empire though that wasn't a really established piece of lore when that was all written in 1988 87 so. i think that box of battle masters is still in my parents basement i need to go find that thing as a video right there yeah sure but you'll see the references yeah. to things you know if you know warhammer yeah it had all like, the books and stuff in there too mm -hmm. oh, you'll see reichland and all the things that would become sort of iconic about the world the best part about that game is it had little catapults that you put rubber bands in and these things you'd shoot, and they worked. And so, like, the game was, like, you could fucking shoot little marbles at your opponent's dudes and knock them over. Like, they're just going to kill your miniatures, literally. Mm. Don't, uh, the don't paint The cannon those. was better than the ogre. Oh, that's like. true. The cannon. Yeah. The cannon was better than the ogre. Don't mm. let that ogre in. Anyway. I've never played it, so I have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, it, it's when, not When this it. game released 
Scott didn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> you, you love that. <laughs> That's your favorite joke. I do. I, my, You're like, wait, was Scott a fetus when this thing happened? <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> exactly. Like what Vince is always asking. Charting it out. It's all right. <laughs> All right, we're all the age. You can you can laugh at me when I'm dead in the ground. Oh, I you're definitely will. When you're dead in the ground, I'll young and virile. fucking laugh at you. Absolutely. But yeah, when I'm young and virile and fucking <laughs> 75 or 80 years old or whatever. Ah, got him. <laughs> yeah, I finally won. Take that. I'm uh, like a fucking stroller, yeah. <laughs> Baby stroller, because, yeah, I, I regress as a, as a human. Sure, you Benjamin Button, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Scott, Vince, can you believe it? Broken Anvil has decided to sponsor this podcast again. I can, John. Turns out the Goody Peepees love miniatures, and BA has them covered. For nine bucks a month, you get creative and unique designs every month. This month's design is Lords of Loxhaven, which is, you know, something you can print at home. And it's like classic fantasy meets 1920s crime organization stuff. See? Bands of goblin and dwarvish mobsters battle for control of Luxhaven's seedy underbelly, all while the orc constables attempt to thwart their criminal doings. As always, it's never just a set of cool minis. They always include some amazing terrain, heroes, and monsters like a keg golem known as the Moonshine Monstrosity. And along with these fantasy bandits and badges, this month's collection includes terrain and a freaking steam-powered patrol wagon? And along with this month's collection, patrons will receive a free 5E compatible set of stat blocks, including an amazing car. It's known in canon as M-A-D-E, Mobile Armored Dragon Escort. So whether you're playing an RPG game or you just want a bunch of fun miniatures to print and paint, Broken Ample has got you covered with another month of creative and finely tuned miniatures for 3D printing. All right, so check out our best friends over from Seattle, Broken Anvil Miniature, patreon.com slash broken anvil to see all the cool stuff you can get each month. And thanks for supporting the podcast. All right, on to the main topic. We have Vince here, and he made a new game with Uncle Adam's help from Tabletop Minions. And we want to talk about, you know, game design, because I think John and I are both aspiring game makers. We want, we like we, we like and enjoy games. Someday yeah. we want to make our own game. Yeah. And so we want to steal your ideas and do it better, right? Yeah. We want to see all the, see all the mistakes. I just turned Mike Tyson for a second. <laughs> I just, I just want to see all the mistakes you've made in your games, Vince, so I don't make them myself. Sure. And so... <laughs> <laughs> and so my game is great and Scott's game is great because they're going to be the same game yeah. and your game there people are like hey look you're just like the shoulders we're standing on yeah so give us your shoulders yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> happy to lend out my shoulders they, they are broad and strong yes. John, just for you I can support you my little baby bird so uh, yeah no that's fine I'm, I, I love talking about game design and I love talking about making games it's very fun I fully believe you guys could maybe eventually, possibly <laughs> make a game. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I I certainly believe mostly in your ability to make that happen. The second part of your sentence. Oh, that's better that's, than yours. Well. Well, everything I make is the best, Vin, so. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. The gauntlet has been thrown. So while we were over in UK, you made a really interesting claim that I have not forgotten about. And I'm cause, ready. Because I'm always curious about, like, how do you get started? Like, where... Where does it all begin? Because this is such a massive book with so many rules, so many ideas in it, both artistically and also from rules. It's like, where did it start? And when we were over there, you were like, okay, you should, as an experiment, write a rule set. Was it one rule set? Okay, and it has to fit in a page, it has right? to fit in a page. Okay, and you, you said, make 100 of these? Yeah, do 100, do 1,000 if you can. Okay, and... Which is hard. So did, is this where that process started for you? Like this was one of those games you wrote on a page? No. Uh, the the sort of – so uh, let me break this into two different things. Okay. Okay. So first of all, what's the, what, what is Scott talking about since he didn't give enough context there? <laughs> Whoops. Uh, that's all right. Let me, let me help your audience out. Okay. <laughs> uh, what I am suggesting as a – if you're somebody who wants to do game design, one of the best things you can do – is learn how to be brief and concise and write effective rules. And it's the Mark Twain quote, I'm sorry, this letter is so long, I didn't have time to make it brief. And mm. so the challenge there is, can you write a functional, interesting game in a page? Okay. Mm. And 
So if you can do it, if you can get yourself down to a page and you won't be able to at first, that's so much harder than it sounds. Um, if you can create a primary loop that's functional, primary loop just means the core mechanic that's being expressed the most often. Uh, so in, if you think of a game like Warhammer, that would be like the hit wound and save role, for example, or something like that. Right, right. Uh, so if you can get that down to something, even if it's not that interesting, even if it's just functional, that's still a win. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you need to learn how to trim excess stuff. The problem with most people when they approach game design is it's a very additive process because they come to it from experience with other games and they're like, well, I, you know, I really like this game, mm. but... I want it to also have this. Mm -hmm. And they want to just layer on stuff. It's Anybody can layer on stuff. It's, re it's really easy um, because no game is as deep as reality. So there's always another layer you can add on when you're abstracting, which is what games are. Games are just abstractions. And so the, the real challenge is to do that, write a bunch of just small, compelling things. And yeah, you can use that as an idea file to later build out. Um, I did that many years back. And then eventually... You know, I don't I don't do that as much anymore. I feel like I've gotten to the point where like I, I understand how to keep things relatively concise and and tight. So now what I do is I have there's a pipeline. OK. OK. I assume there's a little Hello Kitty notebook that we just need to find in his basement. Yeah. And steal it. Yeah. It's just filled with amazing game ideas yeah locked away in my safe that's yes. the trick game ideas are worth nothing i'll tell you if it's not something i think we're going to actually publish i would tell you every game idea that i have like the only reason i'm not saying them because i think we're going to publish them is just because i don't want to spoil the surprise for everyone right not because i care at all if you people know the idea your idea is worthless that's important thing number one i think in general right yes ideas are worthless without execution correct Exactly. Like, you, who cares? You have a neat game idea. A million people have neat game ideas, right? Mm -hmm. um, apples to apples was a was a somebody had that as an idea, but then somebody executed on it in a really good way, and it completely reinvented sort of party card games, right? And now there's Cards Against Humanity and a million bajillion bajillion knockoffs, and it's a whole new way to play. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the core concept, if I explained magic, is not. <laughs> is not in any way revolutionary, at least to the sound of it. Like, it's going to be a randomized pack of cards, and they'll interact, and you'll have monsters fight and cast spells to each other. It's like, okay, that, cool, mm -hmm. neat. Uh, you know, but to say that that's going to l just quite literally change the world, right? And that's because of the execution. If they had come out and executed like the D&D &D card game did, where it was rushed to production and, and you know, TSR botched it so horribly... Uh, it wouldn't have changed the world, <laughs> right? Right. The idea wasn't enough. Okay. The execution is what mattered, right? Richard Garfield made an extremely compelling game along with the other people there at that time who who worked with him to refine the process. So execution is everything. But yeah, I have a big idea file of just things that I bounce around, um, things that interest me. And when I actually sit down to design one, when one gets plucked, you are ripe, sir. Yes. <laughs> From the incubation pipeline. <laughs> uh, then the first thing I do is, I mean, it, do you, is this going to be interesting? Do you want me to get into all the, the, the nitty gritty of this? I am. I'm here for it. I am so ready for this. All right. So step one is, if this is boring, everyone, I apologize. You have nothing, to, no one to blame but these two, but I'll try to make it <laughs> as saucy no, as possible. No, this is great. This is great. Uh, step one is you write guiding principles. So, or first principles, they have different names, but it's always the first thing you do. You write that before everything else. Um, by the way, if you want to learn about game design, there are many good books about this. There are resources out there you can read about. Um, read about the uh, read about the big model of game design, stuff like that. So Robin Laws has a write a lot of good books, but there, there's several people who've written stuff about that. But the big model is generally what I sort of adhere to as a concept. The issue is that everybody wants to jump straight to ephemera, and ephemera means the stuff that you think you care about. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. like, a space marine has a three-up armor save. Right, yeah. Okay. That is ephemera. There's nothing actually integral to the game about that. Mm. Space marines could have any armor save. The armor saves themselves are ephemera, right? Um, but that's the first thing people want to write, is they want to write, like, the coolest of equipment or the awesome guns or the sweet cool mutants or, you know, whatever. Um, but that's all wrong. That's starting at the wrong place. You want to start with your guiding principles. And your guiding principles lay down who is the target market for this thing, 
Um, in other words, who are your potential clients? Mm -hmm. And I mean that if you intend to sell it or not, I don't really care if you're intending to actually sell the product. Even if you're just like writing it for fun, you should always think of a target market first. Um, so what kind know, of, if it's like, I'm going to make up a game for my friends to come over and play tonight. Who are my friends? What do they like to do? Yeah, like, exactly. What kinds of games do they like to play? It's good to have like a guiding principle for like your game design so that you can always kind of like look to a mechanic and be like, okay, is this a good idea or not? Well, would my target audience like it? Yes or no? Then you can kind of use that as justification. 100%. You got it dead on. Like the, the game you and I talked about last night, like the game that, you know, I think is That your you absolutely shit game. on and that was totally worthless and you hate me for it? I did not say any of that. He said it all It is not that. the Morbius of and then games. And he was like, then he was like, wait, aren't you a fetus? And then I was like, God damn it, Vince! <laughs> I did say the second part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we got into a large battle tech discussion. Uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, battle tech. tech. We did. Uh, so you just got four more comments because I said the word Battletech. <laughs> <laughs> if you say the word Battletech in a podcast, four people will comment, okay, guaranteed. Okay. There's going to be three people who, or two people who say, I love Battletech, it's the coolest thing ever, and two people who say they hate Battletech. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Okay, the next intro should be just, should just be like, Battletech, Battletech, Battletech. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why the fuck did you say Battletech on your podcast? <laughs> so... Uh, those people are we're, we're typing when I said they're typing like right now they're watching it I, I just freaked them out and now they're kind of backing off a little bit right, yeah. like, but if I don't type it then I'll make him wrong but if I do type it then he's right but what do I want but I really want to type it <laughs> yeah. okay anyways so yeah the guiding principle of the target market the key is like your game would be would, would suit uh you know, you want a fairly competitive audience, somebody who's interested in sort of skill testing and skill building. Um, you want a high skill floor, a high skill ceiling, uh, where the difference in the game largely comes from the choices players are uh, critically making throughout the play experience, right? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's a certain type of person, and that's a certain type of game, mm -hmm. and all of the mechanics need to flow from that, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be, like, your primary guiding principles. Mm -hmm. Everything I just said would be the guiding principles for that game, right? So it would be, like, high skill floor, high skill ceiling, skill testing, decisions made during the game are largely determinative of game outcome, mm -hmm. right? Compared to, uh, I don't know, shoots and ladders, right? Like, uh, shoots and ladders is a family game. It's not skill testing at all. It has a very low skill floor. And the decisions you make are basically zero. You're rolling <laughs> dice and then zipping around the board, right? Yes. Uh, RNG is determining everything. You're so, saying skill testing. What does that mean? Uh, it means during at during the game, there are going to be decisions that players will make. How much do those decisions influence the outcome of whether or not they are victorious or not or successful or not in executing against the game's stated goals, right? That's okay. skill testing. Okay. Um, and even within certain games, there can be variants of that. You know, for example, in Age of Sigmar, there are certain armies that are like way more forgiving in, in, in certain skill testing areas. Like m movement is an incredibly skill testing area of Age of Sigmar. But if you're playing Nurgle, your army's fairly slow, so moving is actually very important. But your army's tough enough that if you move them into the wrong place or make a wrong move, it's like well, whatever you can. You, somebody else can hit you, and it doesn't matter, right? So there's there's can be a sort of leeway in the in how much the choices are determinative, right? Um, so that's that skill testing. So that's that's step one is you set down those guiding principles, mm -hmm. right? Um, the next thing I do is I create a rough outline of the components that I think will be necessary. Uh, what I mean here is like, this is just like where it's sort of my brainstorming session where I just put notes often into my phone into a dedicated document for that thing or something and say, uh, you know, this game should have combat. It should feel like this. And this is how complicated I want the combat to be. And this will be how we make the primary loop interesting. And these should be the kinds of things people are making. And, uh, I want this game to have a base building mechanic or, you know, whatever. Right. It's, it's more of just like, I throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall to yeah. then later start building into a formal outline. Mm -hmm. A lot of black boxes. You know, I don't want yeah. to define them yet, but you know, you want to have them in there. Yeah, exactly. It, it, that's exactly right. You're just, your, your black box is absolutely correct, Scott. That's right. Cause you don't know what's in there yet. Right. You're just setting down a bunch of boxes that you're like, okay, later I'm going to fill this with stuff. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm. And then you move to a formal outlining stage where you're actually not, again, you're still not writing ephemera. <laughs> still not writing. Not any, yet. <laughs> you're not writing any rules yet. Right. Or not any detailed rules. Maybe you're writing like the primary loop. 
And I kind of outline it and just say, this is the kind of way the book should go and blah, 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 blah. This is the kinds of things it should it should then have. I take it like a level down and formally put it sort of in order and say, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. It's a more structured way because with the boxes, I'm just kind of throwing them all out there in a pile. This is me taking them and building a stack out of mm -hmm. them. Which boxes you didn't don't want to worry about or don't even plan on using right yeah. yeah you might cut boxes out right yeah, like some boxes might not go together very well right exactly you yeah. might think like oh never mind i don't need that base building mechanic that's just going to be some extra nonsense and, and really it's not going to make the game any more fun so cut it right yeah well there's an idea in and of itself like killing your darlings you know which is mm. a phrase in the movie business where it's like i love this idea for a game but it just doesn't work for this product you have to take it out maybe use it for a future idea right but it just doesn't work yeah. for this thing you know yeah. yeah that's a hard thing to do sometimes how do you know when an idea needs to get cut uh well i'll say two things they're way easier to cut when you're doing this formal process because you haven't written or really invested mm. anything into it yet like i didn't write the base building rules i didn't sit down and put hours of blood sweat and tears into making complicated base building rules that i then have to cut your sunk cost of your time and life into the thing is what makes you reticent to cut it, right? Yeah. Um, so if you do it early, cut early, cut often is my my motto, right? Um, because then it's like, whatever. I wrote down two words on a page, like base building. <laughs> mm, <right. laughs> I'm not emotionally invested yet, right? Right, right. How do you know when to cut it when it violates your guiding principles or when or late much later down the line when you get feedback from other people? Because there's definitely a strong feedback stage where someone tells you like, hey, this is this is bad. OK, um, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> like, listen. Right. Uh, that matters a lot. OK. Uh, and then instead of trying to write all the details, because now finally that you have that outline, you can start filling in the blanks and start writing the actual rules and ephemera and details. But you don't need to actually write everything. Like, start by just writing the primary loop. What if it's a combat game? Like, how do you damage somebody? How do you make? How do you make other person be hurt? <laughs> right. <laughs> Figure that out, and then just do it. Just test that. Play a super early alpha with you and your friends. That's and what I was gonna ask. Like, how early are you chucking dice to I mean, that, test mechanics? That like day one. Like you, I need a page of stuff to test mechanics. Right. Like. Okay, we're going to set up some figs. We'll just imagine that there's a setup. We'll imagine there's maybe even movement rules. Like, we'll just kind of guess and see what we feel like, like what logically makes sense. And we're just going to run at each other and try to stab each other's faces off, right? And, and see how that feels. Does it feel compelling? Am I rolling too many dice, too little dice, you know? And you'll find issues, like, really, really fast mm -hmm. um, doing this because you can easily get into the place where you're like, okay, we've been at this now for 20 minutes with these two figs and I've done two damage to you and you've done one damage to me and I designed the game where everybody has 30 life. <laughs> I got to make some changes, son. <laughs> right? And that's a really easy thing to get yourself into because, you know, on paper, it might seem like it works, but then when you actually put it into, into process and test it, that's when that kind of stuff comes out. So it's never too early to start testing. So, you know, have friends you can trust and people you can you can rely on who will give you honest opinions. Uh, and and chess so not, early. So days. not John, essentially. I shouldn't. I shouldn't have him test my game. I think. I think you two, <laughs> having spent a, a decent amount of time with both of you, and considering you both very good friends, I think the two of you would would be, uh, you know, have given me feedback on stuff before. John, uh, uh, you know, alpha tested uh, Space Station Zero when it was very early on. Yeah, like he's a co-author, right? Co-founder. Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting for my royalties in the mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you you get you do have a credit in here, John. I saw you ask the question. <sighs> Thanks for play testers and those who provided feedback. There's John Ninos, right? There. Yes, I did it. That's all I want in my in my life is to be able to be on the inside cover of a Vince Venturella book. Absolutely. So, Damn, so you know they out. like when when you guys tested that. I had very little, you know, actually mm -hmm. truly written. Right. I had a rough concept of what I thought the crew math was going to look like, mm -hmm. like what the various stats were going to be. And I had the primary loop written and yeah. that was it, you know, so I had to take a more active hand and like actually run them through the thing. Mm -hmm. It um, was, yeah, it was, there was the primary loop and it was also like the objective scoring, right? the scoring system. Um, but even at that level, I could till still very much tell that like, this felt fun. The speed of it felt fun. The interaction of the game felt fun. And you, it was, I could tell from playing it, it wasn't a finalized product, but I could, not even having to talk at this point, to talk to Vince about his next steps, I could envision the game 
where it could go, what cool things. I'm like, oh, yeah, this and this. I could I could envision it from playing it. And so that's where I was like, man, to have that experience, I feel like that's kind of what you're going for. 100%. In exactly. The early yeah. yeah. Someone getting excited about it and being yes. like, oh, this and this and this. 100%. Yeah. It'll keep you writing. That's another thing. Yeah. Um, so two things. I did make changes based on the experiences I had watching you guys play and your feedback. Like right away, I realized that I was setting some of the um, challenge numbers too high for the number of successes. And so I kind of moved things the around. Stupid turrets, Vince. Yes, those turrets. OP, OP turrets. <laughs> those have a different, like there is a scenario or a challenge in the book that's more or less what you guys played through. Because that yeah. was like an alpha version of that one. And uh, the the numbers you'll find are, are different than what you guys originally did. Because I, I went through it and... You know, I played it multiple more times since you guys did that. Uh-huh. And, but I right away it told me, okay, my my initial sort of preconceptions of where I thought those numbers should be was wrong, mm. right? And I needed to move stuff around. Um, so, yeah, and that is really the biggest thing. Like, you asked, what does it take? What it takes is grit and determination of uh you know a herculean level because like anything worth doing in life mm-hmm. yeah you have to be able to to really just knuckle down and do this thing and it's going to be hundreds of hours of writing and people taking it apart and then you have to put it back together and make changes and make changes and make changes and make changes and that's just to get the actual rules written right that's not the actual printing and publishing process where you're getting into then you have to take that in and do all the editing and all the layout and work with artists and get all the art and then do all the pre-work for it and everything like it's it's just hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of work right that's kind of adam's purview mostly right he deals with those those steps yeah exactly so within within snarling badger it's a great partnership adam is wonderful and i i i truly truly value him as a partner because he is good at all the things i'm bad at and i'm at least passable at the things he's not as good at so it's he i'm 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 partnering up here um but he's you know yeah he's great at like i mean he's done he's worked with photoshop and done layout work and and that kind of thing for 25 years now i can tell because he made overlays for our stream and uh they were incredible i was like wow you really know what you're doing yeah i mean he's quite literally done it as a job for two plus decades. So I, yeah. you know, it's, it's where he lives. Um, and he just has a great instinct on this, on this kind of stuff. So yeah, he's, he handles things like the layout and we work together on, on art direction and stuff like that. But then, yeah, he, he does all that. We actually have a uh, editors, you know, people who formally edit it. Cause, uh, what we learned in the first game was don't trust us to edit that thing. Don't edit <laughs> your own work. Uh, which I knew that, but we, we tried to, we just didn't have anybody who could edit it. We do now. Um, and things like that. So, so yeah, it's it's it goes back and forth, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of back and forth. Yeah. So, okay, I had an interesting realization about the game, and I'm curious at what stage in the development you made this choice. I'm assuming it's pretty early on, but most miniature war games are PvP experiences. It's you versus another player, right? Yep, yep. This is a miniature war game, not a board game, right? You wouldn't call it a board game. It's not. That is PvE. And so I, yeah, and I was like, I have never heard of or experienced a game like that. And so at what point in the process were you like, okay, I want it to be PvE and I want it to be like a miniature war game. Obviously, that's what you're shooting for in the beginning. Yep. But when did you decide PvE is the way forward? Pretty early on. And like, there is solo, co-op, and head-to-head. So, I, you know, you, you can still kill your friends if that's what you're down for. Like, there are yes. uh, challenges in there specifically around fighting each other, taking your two mm-hmm. crews against each other. They're not permadeath. Uh, scenarios those are for funsies like so you can have fun you, and then there is you, know, you can grow your crew and you have all the fun stuff and things like that okay. when you do so but those don't have the permadeath tucked into them like the like the uh, PVE does okay. okay because I don't that just feels bad if you're you know fighting your friends to have a fun time and then you lose half your crew and then you can't go explore the space station like what an awful awful experience that is um, right so the the PVE thing came about because of the guiding principles is the short answer to the question. Okay. Because one of the guiding principles that I had in this game was I wanted it to be a mystery to explore and unlock. I wanted it to be a story deeper than just a PvE game. Because there are other um, PvE games out there, certainly. Um, I wanted this to be something where you were learning about the space station as you play the game, where the, these truths 
were revealed over time, right? As as you explore and learn little bits of lore and things like that as it goes. Okay. And and the proper way to do that to to frame that was I needed to lead you through a story and well that just that right there frames it as as you know PvE instead of PvP, right? As as right. being against the game experience, against the space station itself, right? Okay. Um, so question about that, does that reduce the replayability of the game? I'm so glad you asked that question. Yes. Uh, so we thought about replayability a lot, right? And the game is built to be... F I, I don't want to scare anybody with this, but there are roguelike elements in that, right? So, uh, which means that, that there's, as I mentioned, there's permadeath in the PVE. It's it's hard. Like, it, it, it there's a bit of a, a sort of Dark Souls vibe in this. Um, the night is dark and full of terrors. Uh, uh, so, I love it. I love it so much. So it's, you know, the replayability a lot comes into, uh, can you actually beat the game? Like, can you get through? First of all, there are 24 branching uh, challenges in the narrative. You're, you're not going to play all 24 of them as you go through because you'll kind of make choices that will lock off some and you'll go other places and things like that. Um, but you'll play some number of them. I think I think on the I, I have a map that maps all of the potential paths through the game, of course. Uh, and I think the longest if you if you like went the absolute longest route, I think you played 19 of the 24 is basically what it boils down to. Okay. That's a lot. Um, there is a miracle path. I did build in a miracle path where if you happen to do everything correctly, you could get there in a really short amount of time. I won't oh. say how few, but but it's in there um, just because I, it's fun to have stuff like that. Like if somebody accidentally discovers it, like yeah. that's a neat thing, right? That is, that is neat. Um, that they can sort of, it's like the old, I was very much shaped by uh, by Super Mario Brothers 3, right? You could, <laughs> where you could go down and find that uh, that warp whistle to get to, to World 8 all of a sudden. <laughs> Uh, I watched The Wizard with Fred Savage. You know. Yeah, the first time that game was ever seen was when he had to play it live. Again, Scott was a fetus when this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, when this yeah. game came out. Um, California! Exactly. <laughs> uh, but for those of a certain age cohort, this is a very impressionable thing. He's beaten Ninja Gaiden four times and he hasn't died once. Yes. That's the most incredible... When I heard that, I was like... "This That's is not most, possible. It's not possible. This is the most incredible game player in history. Anyways, um... So the the much like Ninja Gaiden, the replayability often comes with the fact that that the game is hard and you probably won't beat it the first time through. Right now, at the same time, because you'll you there are choices you'll make that will lock off different paths, and there are different uh, things to experience. You can also replay it, and uh, I haven't said this in any video or thing yet, so I, I don't know why I haven't. I'll probably talk about Top it. Top exclusive. Tomorrow. Oh, um, never mind. But yeah. So, so, <laughs> This is the first time I'm saying it, but this won't be the first no. time you're hearing it. Yeah, yeah. There is a bit of a we snuck in. I know you'll like this, uh, John, because I know you like these games. Like we snuck in. We snuck in a little bit of a legacy component uh, uh, to this. Uh, so <laughs> for those familiar with with sort of board games that have a legacy option, where the board game will will permanently change based on the sort of actions that you take in the game, you actually like. Uh, oftentimes literally put stickers or things over the yeah. game and and permanently change the the game board um if you happen to actually uh, succeed in beating the the game and completing the series of narrative challenges as it were under certain circumstances there can be legacy impacts on future runs of it so not only will your future runs uh will you encounter different things different enemies different challenges different knowledge different secrets as you explore the space station but also the nature of the thing itself will be changed if you were previously successful okay you know the I, ship is alive that is very cool also i want to say that replayability is a thing people like to pick on but it, I feel like it doesn't actually matter that much. It's like it's okay if you play this game and it, you know, uh, like over the course of several weeks or months, it takes up some amount of tens of hours of your time. Like that was a worthy investment, you know. Yeah, hundred like, percent. Not every game needs to be like I can play this forever, you know. Right. Like there is some value in limiting that scope. You have more yeah. of a narrative experience, yeah. right? And I will tell you from my experience because every Saturday we, m me, Dan, and Alexa, we play board games but they are always cooperative because they like cooperative games um, and they're very intricate games and my perception of legacy games prior to having played one sure. was like you get this and anyone that has this feeling this is kind of a natural 
human response is to get the most value for your money, right? If I can only play this one time all the way through, then it's not value. And whether or not you're consciously thinking that, there's some part of your lizard brain that's just like, this is not a good investment of my resources. Yeah, which is completely wild because like we don't think about that with any other medium. No. You know, I don't buy a book and be like, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to read, I need to read this book six times. Yeah, like, or read, like a movie or something like that. Yeah. yeah. yeah if it's not something that I'm going to watch 17 times, I'm, I'm never going to go to the theaters and watch it. But uh, but then after having played a number of those, <laughs> including Gloomhaven. So Gloomhaven, incredibly successful. Um, and I would argue that Gloomhaven is in a box mostly for accessibility, for ease, for more easily consumption. Sure. But it's more of a, a game akin to what I'm feeling Vince's game is than it is a board game. Um, but that is a complete legacy game. You tear up stuff. You change things forever. You you can pretty much play the game one time. And it's widely regarded as the best or one of the best board games ever made, especially in this genre. Um, and so... After having done it, I'm like, I am so satisfied. I felt like we experienced so much. Did we do everything? No, but I really had a great experience. I'm ready to say we beat it and put it down. Mm-hmm. You know, and like, like that's a, that's, that's fine. a good that's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the number one thing you can do for replayability, I think I think you're right. A lot of people get them their heads wrapped around the axle on this when it really doesn't matter that much. Because the number one thing you can do for replayability is just write a fun game. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that there you will go. Make people want to play it. Right. If it's fun, people will play it. Yeah. It's not. It's not that complicated of a recipe there, right? Like, how do you get people to come back to your restaurant? Um, don't serve food that sucks. Yeah. Right? Like that's probably number <sighs> one. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> right. Really, um, really breaking new ground here. I I have a couple of things, but I'm not going to bombard you all at once. I, it was more a more of a, an observation. As uh, Scott and I spent like four straight hours discussing our game on their way back from Vinci Con like a y- year and a half ago. We were just trapped in ephemera, dude. We were. I, <laughs> yeah. As he's saying that, my brain's like, no, <laughs> like not the, ephemera, no. <laughs> the train was coming straight at us the whole time. We it's were just. Because it's compelling, right? That's, that's what, a, you, it's excited it's what about. you get excited about. That's why you got to manually step in and slow yourself down. Yeah. And I think that there may be a, a, a world, because I was trying to like. Uh, go through my brain and like justify this and say it's not all fucked John it's not all fucked to take <laughs> the, that excitement and the thoughts about it and then put it in a, in a box yeah. in a, not a black box but an unmarked box and then move back up a few steps because that's still those clouds will still be around there and they will help us make those earlier decisions sure. right and 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 actually, then going back and opening that box up again later, you'll probably be you have a lot more confidence and, and be be more decisive in decision making. Yeah, it's not as though by having that discussion, it's like, oh well, we can't write that game now. <laughs> we we screwed it up. It up. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. You just like you, you put all that to the side. You step up and say, okay, now that we've talked this through and we think there's a, a there there, we got some fun things that we think will be compelling down the line. Then you, yeah, you take it back to the high level. You just don't, and but right. you just got to be willing to 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 change, cut, alter, whatever those ideas that you had before in light of doing all that other work. Yeah. How many elements in your game are inspired by other games? Like, is there anything intentional you pulled? You're like, man, I really love this aspect of this one game. I'm going to take it and make it my own in my own game. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, this is this can probably be... In Space Station Zero, not much, I think, is probably, honestly, the answer. Okay, it's all Vince um, all the way down? No, it's not original. I don't. I'm not. That's not what I'm claiming. Oh, okay. It, it, nothing's original. There is no original ideas. All, humanity thought of everything 2,300 years ago. Everything, everything we've been doing since is a repeat. So, <laughs> um, the like, you, it's it stops more or less with with the Greeks. They they got it all hammered <laughs> out, and then we've just been on repeat ever since. Yeah. Um, the but like most of the ideas are a, I play a lot of games I read a lot of games I study a lot of games I mean that's which is by the way if you want to be a game designer the number one most important thing you can do is read and play and understand uh, other games that's I cannot encourage that enough yeah 
um, have a wide and broad understanding of what's out there and what have people written and what do you like? Yeah. Uh, because you're going to end up drawing on those concepts, even if not directly, just sort of as an homage or a, as something informing decisions you're making of things you like or you don't like. Mm. Um, so there wasn't anything real specific here that I that I drew on or really um, tried to build on in any specific way. Um but that, but certainly, I've done that before, where I've thought, "Hey, I, I really like this thing." Uh, you know, in Rain and Hell, Rain and Hell has a really unique initiative system. Um, as uh, this one is different, um, but still not like really anything else. I think that's out there that I that's at least too well known. Um, but the you know, Rain and Hell that 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 initiative system uh, started for me talking about liking things like bolt action where you have a bunch of you know each of your units has a die you put all the die in a bag you blind draw out of the bag and, and that sets it up and so then i started thinking about ways to do that but without hidden knowledge and how would i actually want it to play where it could become a skill testing element of the game right right mm, kind of you, you so, know the order yeah so so that kind of stuff um can act as a springboard you, you know no part of rain and hell's initiative feels anything like bolt action or anything like that anymore right but it was a springboard to get me thinking about a thing that i like and then how i would want it to do and what are the consequences of that to the player yeah yes so games have uh an idea called like feel bad moments in them yeah yeah we're all familiar with our favorite feel bad moments from all of our games like in guild ball when you run into someone who has um and they just move away two inches and now you can no longer hit them it's like get fucked you know yeah. um are do you when you're making games do you intentionally try to limit feel bad moments do you ex in your play testing period do you experience them you're like that's one of those things gotta fix it or are you kind of more like that's part of the game and I want to have those consequences because I want people to like, you know, balance that risk versus reward decision. So the answer is that category that you asked about is too broad because there are two different kinds of feel beds. Okay. And one of them will absolutely make people not want to play your game. And one of them you can you can have. Okay. Where does one okay rolling a one that. for my charge and my guy doesn't get to hit ever? Like okay. where what that's where does that the, fall? That's in the, the bad kind you want to limit. Okay. Every game that relies on RNG has the potential for this kind of thing. Um feel bads fall into two categories. Uh in my control and interactive or out of my control and non interactive. Okay. Okay. In my control, interactive, out of my control, not interactive. Okay. Correct. So, like, for example, um, I'll, I'll reach back to very early Age of Sigmar, okay? There was a type of terrain called deadly. And deadly terrain, if you moved across it, you roll, rolled a die. And if you rolled a one, that model was slain instantly, okay? So it didn't matter how who that was. Archeon, Grand Marshal of the Apocalypse, High Lord, the Ever Chosen, the Champion of the Four, right? The, the Destroyer of the World. Uh, if he set his giant pie plate base down on a rock that was deadly and then rolled a one, he's dead. Okay, like he, oops, he, he hurt his oops. toes. He, he hit his toesies, right? Now, that was a stupid mechanic, but it was completely largely under your control. You could just not do that. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Like, don't, <laughs> I went to the doctor. I said, doctor, it hurts when I go like this. He said, don't go like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, like, that kind of stuff you can have a little more of. I mean, that mechanic's still bad because, obviously, that's just completely silly and, and it breaks for similitude. But you can have stuff like that if the players are allowed to 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 be like, I am willing to risk it for the biscuit here. Yeah. And they're making informed decisions about it. Yeah. Because then on the other side of it, they're like, oh, well, it didn't work out, but I'm the one who decided to put myself in that position. Right. The stuff you want to avoid is when it's like, okay, the game has instructed me to roll a die and I rolled a die and I got a one. Okay, now I have to roll another die. Okay, I got a one. Okay, my model's dead and I lose the game. Great. Yeah, kind of like uh, rolling for turn initiative. A very uh, popular mechanic that's still in that game. That is actually an example of the first part because you No, you've have... just talked about it for so long that now it's in that, that <laughs> other category. You have control over how you set up your forces for turn priority because you know it's coming. It's a known quantity. Well, you do know it's coming, but... Um, it still feels fucking bad when it happens. <laughs> I, I, the priority role in AOS is certainly a, a subject of much discussion and, and, and does create a, uh, it is an interesting example of a potential feel bad in that 
uh, primary category I talked about because it is interactive. You have the the choice of how you set your figures. You know when it's coming. You know when you're at risk for it. If you're playing at the top of a turn, then you know that the whoever goes second may have the chance to win priority into the next round, and you better account for that in your movement and your choices and your things like that. It ends up being a skill testing element of the game to do so. It's forced. It's forced because if you don't account for it, you will fuck yourself. Um, potentially, unlike, you can put yourself in a situation. Yeah. Unlike dangerous terrain, where it's like. I can just choose to not walk over this terrain. That is a mechanic that you are compelled to do. You have, you cannot dodge it, it in that way to avoid that potential feel bad moment, which is why maybe, obviously this is like a spectrum probably between these two groups, right? Sure. And for me, this that, that one mechanic kind of like falls into the, this kind of sucks sometimes um, feeling. Yeah, I mean, I love it and find it to be a strength of the system. I can mm -hmm. see how that is, is relevant to psychographic profiles, but that's where we come to two interesting different elements mm. of game design, uh, which is that, one, there are no good rules. Ooh, okay. Okay? And there are no bad rules. Okay? There are only game design elements that have both good and bad, and your job as a designer is to determine it does your target audience that you wrote in the guiding, in the guiding principles and the sort of inclinations and psychological utility that they're going to bring to the table when experiencing your game, are they going to draw more good than bad? Okay. Um, you mentioned the, the priority role in AOS, um, but let me, let me, let's take it out of that for a moment, right? Uh, let's, let's bring it into something non-controversial. You ever played Warcry? You played Warcry, right? I have not played it ever, unfortunately. Oh, that's right, because you didn't play with us when we when we did our first paint jam. He was painting models, bro. <laughs> he was right. so he was far behind slow. on his painting. Yeah, he was so far behind. John, you played Warcry, right? I played Warcry. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> that's why there's two of us. <laughs> so, uh, so John, you know how in Warcry, when you want to roll to hit, you make your attack, right? Yep. You have a number that says, like, this is how many attacks you make. Yep. And you have some kind of strength number. Let's yep. say it's four, and your opponent has a toughness of three, so you need threes to hit. And then it tells you how much your damage is. Let's say it's two per, right? Yep. So I'm going to roll my four dice, and every three results in two damage to my enemy, assuming I don't crit, right? Yep. Okay. That is an extremely abstract mechanic for combat, right? Like, there's no defense roll there. Right. Yeah? It's a static number that you're going that you're competing against. Yep. Right. So that is a choice that was made and that has good and bad to it. So the bad of it is there's no play on the defense side unless i add like reactions or have some special hinky jinky other second mechanics i put in right the primary loop assumes no play on the defense right okay the primary loop assumes that uh that we will roll a very few amount of dice and it will likely result in a very high amount of damage right it will make the game bloody and things will die quickly and it, it will tilt the game toward offense mm -hmm. right? these are all these are all consequences of making that one primary loop decision in the rules, right? Mm. And so that has good elements and bad elements. Like some people want a lot of complexity, want to see more dice, want to see them, want to feel like they can modify or pump their defense and have that, like they mm. draw psychological utility from being, uh, playing anvils and being hard as a rock and being un unmovable and stuff like that, right? And that's not a thing you could do as much in that game and so you have to ask yourself, does the target audience I'm pitching at, are they going to draw more positive than negative from this rule? Every rule has good and bad. And the the real challenge as a game designer is to say, like, where is this falling on balance for the people I think I want to play this game? Mm, sure. Coming back to that first point. Yeah. It always, yeah, that's what I said. That's why you always start with it, because everything derives from that, right? Um, if I was going to make, like, a gunslinging... Uh, Let's say we wanted to make a, a Wild West a, a Wild West gunslinger game, mm, right? Yeah. You know, I would want to get I would want to make that real zoomed in. What I mean by that is like I want to have the gun that I'm using matter, the bullets that I'm using matter, the weather, the wind, the light, the distance, the holster, the, everything. Yeah. The draw time, the, you know, where I hit them, how the I age hit them. your character. How many shots of whiskey did I take at the saloon yeah, first? The, yeah. The drunken factor maybe increases your crit damage, but maybe your reduces your accuracy, you know? Right. Like I, I want to take I want to put a lot of junk into that, right? Like oh, if, yeah. I, if I jump straight to the ephemera. A lot of junk in the trunk. Okay. But 
if I if my guiding principle was I want to make a fun, simple, easy to play Wild West showdown game where you can, you know, play the game quickly and easily and and just kind of like have some fun with your friends, then everything I just said was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Because that is not what those people want to do, right? If you're if you're if you're trying to make a beer and pretzels game, then you can't write a game like I just described. Mm-hmm. You know, so everything has to be derived from those guiding principles first. I, I have a I have a question. So, first of all, I also had the question earlier, but you already answered it about boom. Is, is your uh, is your experience in playing games? Um, helped you in your in your game design which is obviously a yes um but the next one was this is a little bit maybe a little bit more abstract can you get too greedy when you're talking about your guiding principles Uh and who your target audience is can you say i want every person in all continents of all ages to want to play my game yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. You, you you have to have some conception of who the user personas are in the marketplace of games, right? Sure. Which I think us all being around this uh, space for a long time, like we have a conception of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are your 35-year-old uh, father of two dads. They, that's who your AOS audience is targeted at. That's why AOS <laughs> is built like it is, because the average AOS player is a 35-year-old father of two. Um you know, you have uh, people who want a lot more complexity and, and rules and want to, like, really make the list building show. You can use things like the that's, you know, 40K and things like that. You can have – you can use the psychographic profiles of Timmy, Johnny, Spike mm-hmm. um, as potential elements, though you shouldn't really design a game for just one of them. You should think about those as they meet your game and how all three of them might be served. You know, but you can you can broadly construe it. This is for beer and pretzels games. It's for simple things. I want right. this for all ages. I want this for kids. You know, like that kind of stuff is. It, it's not as though you need to go out and hire a market research firm. Like, but right. there is no game that everybody will love, no matter how cool. You, this is another thing you gotta you gotta really internalize. No matter how good your game is, no matter how cool it is, no matter how fun. First of all, there will be people who question every decision you make. Yeah, forever. And you will you will just deal with that forever. The second you put something out in the world, you will have people who are just like, "Why'd you do this instead of this?" And it's like, "Well, because I wanted that. <laughs> that's that's what I wanted." Welcome to the internet. <laughs> yeah. So like that's number one, which is fine by the way. Like everybody's got an opinion. They're free. It's cool. And um, the second thing is you have to understand that there's some people will just hate your game. Yeah. No matter what, they won't just dislike it. Some people will just hate your game. Um, and that's How okay. Because you hate this man's game. Uh, you I, horrible people. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> he makes the greatest games. Uh, well, thank you. That's very kind. I certainly don't do that. I try to make good games, I hope. I put a lot of effort into it, but there are better game designers than me in the world. I'm sure of that. Um, but, the, you know, like, you, but you can't take it personally, right? It's just, it means that it wasn't for them. Mm. And as long as that's not your target market that tends to hate your game, then you're okay. Right. I think YouTube has prepared us for making a game, John. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so my brain went to some a really weird place on this. I'm oh, sorry. Please share. This. Please and share this, with I, us. We're so, excited. Yeah, I want you to, to tell me if I'm right and wrong in this, in how you're talking about target audience and, and how you're saying not everything's for everyone. I merely went, my brain went to stand-up comedy. Okay. Okay. So... I'm a huge fan. Comedy is very subjective, right? Yes. And some of the greatest or most well-known stand-up comedians, um, people just hate them, right? Oh, it's, of course. It's, not, yeah, yeah. it's not your style of comedy. And other ones are wildly successful because they're they're going towards a certain audience. Your Louis Andersons are very family friendly, you know, and then there's the other side of that coin and, sure. and very controversial and, and and so on and so forth. So um, I guess where my brain went to, and you tell me if I'm right, wrong with this, it is not you for you to say whether or not somebody, a stand-up comedian, is funny, but it can be your opinion that they're not funny to you. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the same thing. Like the when when people say this game is bad, I'm like, ugh. What an opinion, right? right? Like, uh, because I don't know what that means. Like, sure, if if it's just badly designed, like if I open the book and the mechanics just clearly don't work or something like that, 
sure, okay, that's that's like a bad game, right? But that's that's not really what you're dealing with with most professional products. Like they're functional. They work. Now, whether they're aligned, whether they they you can have a mismatch, and a lot of times that what that's what people will chafe against, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll have people you'll have people who think they're writing a game for, you know, uh, everybody four to one hundred and four, and you know, uh, mm-hmm. and and in fact they wrote an extremely detailed, you know, super crunchy, super complex thing, and I'm like, mm, no, like there's a core of people who like complexity for complexity again. People do still play BattleTech, uh, <laughs> but, um, but you know that's not that's not the majority of audience, right? You know, um, the the board game world. I understand that Settlers of Catan is in fact the defining game of our generation, as the side of their truck says. Ugh, man, but I really don't like that game. Look at the response there, right? Why? Why don't you like that game? I don't like that game because it has zero comeback mechanics. Like when you, not zero, but very little. So when you kind of get down there, it's like, well, I'm just playing for fun now. I'm like, there's no, or there's very little chance that I'm going to win this game. So that's why I don't like it. John, go through the motions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm never very excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At any portion of the game. Yeah. Am I ever like, oh. Yeah, I never make that face. Resource collecting games can definitely feel like that sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that's just it, right? So there you go. You know, that's why I, I laugh every time I see the side of their truck at Gen Con where it says the defining game of our generation. And I'm like, yeah, is it though? <laughs> like, it's not a bad game. I'm not in any way saying that. But no, like the defining game of our generation, like of the current last decade is, I don't know, Probably apples to apples or something like that. You know, it's apples to apples. Magic the Gathering. It, it, well, that that's probably the previous previous time. Oh, oh, okay, but, but yeah, time. sure. Like Magic would be a, a generation yeah. defining game, right? Wow. Um, you know, Gloomhaven is and and, and what it did because it is yeah. wildly successful is probably a genre defining board game. Um, I think Frosthaven was the new broke the record for Kickstarter, right? Which I completely games. believe. Yeah. So like. And and a lot of those things, you, you know, you mentioned, hey, we get together and people, we get to do this co-op thing and experience it. That's, yeah. you know, that kind of realization has brought a lot more people into the space. Yes. Uh, realizing that there's, you can expand the market beyond just sort of sweaty dudes, I suppose is good. I love sweaty dudes. Tra- trying, we all do. Those are my people. Trying to leave. There's one thing we know from Trapped Under Plastic. <laughs> it's that all three of us love sweaty dudes. <laughs> Not all of us, all three of us love wearing short shorts, but all three of us love, I, it's just like two dudes leaning on each other, hoping that the other one buckles at the knees first. That is competitive. <laughs> that is most competitive games. Just War of you lean first <laughs> and that's it. But it's just like to open the, in, in the market, the cool thing is in seeing one, the rise in board games, the rise in miniature board games, um, the gaming sphere in general is more money is being pumped into it. Yeah. And the market is um, being able to adapt. So we are seeing how many Kickstarter games come out every single week that are now, it's not just ripoffs of Zombicide anymore. Now it's trying to improve, tweak, or or look at it in a couple different directions. Um, and Zombicide's probably up there in terms of we're gonna bring in the circle a little bit of yeah, sure, defining games. Yep, um, you know miniature games themselves too. Like you look at what brought people open around to miniatures from a gaming perspective. I mean, obviously number one is Warhammer, but outside of Warhammer, I'd say Zombicide is. No, I agree. It's it is Stop the milkshake that brought a lot of boys to the yard. Yes, yes. <laughs> it lost weight. I'm right. To the yard. <laughs> okay, bringing it back to Space Station Zero here. Have we talked about the lore of the game at all? Like your fun idea for like what somehow is... probably no. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's briefly go over that because it's a really fun idea that you came up with. I feel like it's Prometheus, but go ahead. Yes, it is. So all right, moving on. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh no. What have I done? Uh, no. Yeah. Sure. So. The well here, I'll do that. You read it. I'm gonna out loud. Read it in your best narrator voice. I'm gonna read the the little first page here, the little setup for this, right? Okay, here we go. In the heart of deepest space, millions of light years from the nearest system, star, or planet, resides an improbable structure, floating in the silent darkness. 
Massive and ancient beyond imagination, it sleeps, waiting for wayward travelers to find their new home. Beautiful. So the basic idea here is uh, the universe is super big. Did you know that? No. Bro, it's so big. It's like so big. (laughs) (laughs) So the universe is really huge. And... Uh, cultures as they develop light speed technology and you know, faster than light technology, FTL tech, uh, FTL tech always has some kind of chance for it to go wrong mm-hmm. in every story, you know, yeah. 40 K and battle tech and, and everything, Star Trek and Star Wars. There's always some chance that your, your hyperspace, your blah, 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 blah whatever it's called. <laughs> right. It's core to the space ball story. Yes, really. exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've gone plaid. <laughs> uh, you know, there's always like some chance that something goes wrong. And so the core idea here is one in a million times when that something goes wrong, the ship doesn't get to where it goes. And instead it finds itself outside of this immense space station. And the space station is massive, again, beyond reason. And there are no other stars or nebulae or worlds or anything for hundreds of millions of light years in all directions. Like this is empty, empty, blank, black space. And even at the, even with their best tech, if they just picked a direction and went, they would all be long dead by the time mm-hmm. that they ever got back to, to anything that resembles a star, let alone their home system. And so, you know, we're just talking about like billions of light years here. And the then their speaker crackles open and or their communication system and it says the space station will accept you. Dock zero is open. And they pull in and they find other ships, some very, very old and cannibalized um, from alien cultures they don't recognize or that aren't anything they've encountered or experienced from other distant parts of the universes. And when they go inside, they find that they can, the members of these this particular ship find that they can speak to everybody and understand everybody that the space station translates everything and you can completely understand and talk to each other and that a little shanty town has been set up in the safe zone of this dock zero where people are now living out their their existences and mm. but most of the space station the vast majority of it is uh unexplored is is dangerous it's dark it's uh full of you know monsters and defenses and and things that will kill you and so the the gameplay here is, and then the sort of story is: Do you, you know, uh, do you have what it takes to go explore the space station to uncover the mystery to figure out why are you here? Why did you? Why are you suddenly outside of the space station? Why are all these other weird alien cultures? Because you find they have the same story. They're like faster than light tech, blipped instead of blooped, and now they're here. And, you know, can you survive? Can you get down in there? Can you understand the mystery? Can you find the truth of it all? And is there any way to escape? Yeah. I mean, that story is is compelling just from like a story perspective. Like I'd, I'd be interested to like to know how the various crews like interact with one another. It's like, like, holy cow, your thing blipped too. Like we're here now. What do we do? Like, like just even just like the interaction, like the dialogue is interesting, which is totally separate from gameplay entirely. Yeah. So it's a really it's a really cool story, um, for sure. Also, there's there's like a lot of question of like meaningless. It's like, well, we can't go anywhere. We can't get back home. I might as well just kill myself. You know, like there's like there's so many different ways this could be looked at based on what kind of person you are. It's like it's super interesting. Yeah. There's a really fun piece of art in here that's all about all of the different aliens interacting yeah. together in their little in their little shanty town i just want to like i just want to be like i just want to set up my own shack here i mean like you guys can go in oh. and there are there are certainly crews that decide not to just do that say, well, we'll it's gonna sell fake oakley's we just live here now that's it fake nikes in my shack nikes, yeah and that's where the that's where the skirmish play comes in by the way like the skirmishing happens when some of these crews occasionally get into to tussles mm, with each other oh, around right, the, right, the right. safe area the, yeah. the thing about that because you know how much I love lore, Vince. Um, the, the, We're all lore nerds here. The uh, the reason why your story is is interesting to me because it appeals um, to me at a core level of an elevator pitch. Okay, and we're so the elevator pitch, and I probably have talked about this on Trapped Under Plastic before. Is we get on an elevator together, 
Um, we're going down to floor one. We're on floor five. And in that time, I ask you, what do you do? Yeah, sure. What do you do for a living? And so you've got about 30 seconds. And can you give me something that is interesting and that does encompasses it well, but is succinct enough for me to leave that elevator and be like, I know what Vince does for a living now. That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. And in most games, they're like, this elevator needs to have 17,000 floors, okay? Right. So that's the only way you're going to be able to get around this. And oftentimes, <coughs> 40K, that's not enough. There is no beginning and end. It is a circular elevator that never ends. There is no beginning. There is no end. So you, I know. Ouroboros, and, yes. And, yeah, and so I know um, that there's this infinite possibilities outside of it. So all all the different unique alien races, all the different points in time and space and everything. I don't need to know all that. I can envision what it could be, but the succinct nature of here's the situation and my imagination going from there makes it memorable. Yeah. Right. It's the, and that's, we, I focus a lot and we focus a lot on making sure that we can give an, an easy elevator pitch. Like for example, my, my pure elevator pitch on the game and the story would be space station zero is a, um, sci-fi managers agnostic survival skirmish game where your crew explores an ancient dilapidated space station to uncover the mystery of whether or not they can survive i'm in for it i'm there in for go. it too i love it so i'm curious you made rain and hell yep. that was the first game that you and adam made together um, you're wearing a rain and hell shirt that, right Where can now? we get that rain and hell merch, Vince? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> mm, this is one of a kind. Oh, no. We're still working on the merch store. I'm sure Adam will get that set up very soon, and we'll have some. I, I really I really do want to get, we do want to get the merch store set up soon because this new art for Space Station Zero is, like, beyond amazing, and I want to put some shirts and stuff out there with that. Yes. Stuff I want a shirt with that logo. I want a white shirt with that logo on it. Yeah, totally. Okay. All right. Anyways, um... I'm curious if there are any like personal victories or triumphs or goals you had with this game that you accomplished uh, in a better way or that you weren't able to accomplish with, with Rain and Hell previously. Was there something you were going for with this game where it was like, ah, oh, I couldn't do that before, but now I can and now I'm ready? Yeah, I mean, the, the goal of this was to, to allow a story to unfold, and I'm really happy with how that came out. Okay. And that's not... Like, Rain and Hell does have a, a, a story going on. Like, if you play the expansion uh, for it, the Oculus Sphere, which has a somewhat similar structure, like there's six narrative uh, connected missions you play through, there is an underlying story of what's going on in the world and what's driving toward, and that could lead to future stories. Uh, but, you know, with this, I really wanted to tell something that was contained, concise, and and... And, and that the players would find compelling as they went through there. And I, I do feel like that's what happened. Okay. I'm, I'm actually really happy with that. Okay. Wonderful. Is this at all inspired by like your love of role-playing games and narratives unfolding over the, that? hundred yeah. percent. This is the, this is a much more uh, role-playing influenced uh, game than I, than rain and hell was. Uh, I mean, I love role-playing games. I've played role-playing games since when, I was a fetus. fetus. There we go. Uh, since before you were born. I was totally blank in there. I was like, okay. I don't know how long you've been playing. <laughs> okay, I'm you. glad you caught up there. You got it. You got no, it. It was yeah, good. Yeah. We got there. My reference game is so weak that I can't even remember references made like an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> in this very podcast. Yes. Um, but yeah, the the I you know I, I'm a long time role playing fan, and I, I wanted to to look at it's not like incorporating rpg elements is anything new to to miniature wargaming you know yeah. that's long been a thing in fact i would argue it was the initial thing right uh, you know first edition warhammer fantasy battles does not look like what you think warhammer fantasy battles look like it looks like D D, but with much more heavy miniature play it looks closer to like fourth edition D D. frankly mm -hmm. um those are actually much more simpatico uh so role-playing was a, elements in those kinds of advancements have always had their that DNA has always been mixed up. So this is just me pulling on that thread. Okay, very cool. All right, so what we've learned is that our game is terrible and we've done everything backwards <laughs> and that uh, Space Station Zero is there for us to all have our own creative ideas to make our own alien races and turn them into miniatures and play a game. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is also true. And finally, that we have to raise the money to hire Vince um, as a contractor to do most, most of the work 
on our game. And Adam can do the rest of the work. And Adam can do the rest of the work. I don't want to do anything. Yeah. I want, to like, I want them to come to us with like big storyboards yeah. and like yeah, yeah, playing yeah. cards and uh, like lunch pails and stuff and be like, Ugh. and we're like, mm, yes, yes, no, yes, yes. Get out of here. Yep. Are you are you into that kind of relationship? Uh, I am available. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of consulting work, I am very expensive. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. well, um, are you able to be paid in tendies and diet do? No, unless those are unless there's like a bed of cash underneath those <laughs> tendies. <laughs> right. Right. So hold the slaw extra extra cash. Cash. Okay. Correct. Okay. I think we're getting a little closer. This is called negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, if you guys want to check out Space Station Zero, we'll have everything for it linked down in the description of the show notes, depending on where you're listening. We'll also have links to Vince's YouTube channel and also Adam's YouTube channel. Both of them are fantastic YouTubers. Check out their game. Check out their channels. Let's move on to the next part of the podcast, which I think- Can I say one more thing before you end this section? No! Okay, yeah, what's up? I hope other people are inspired by this and do try to write their own games and stuff. It is really fun. It, you mm. don't need to, don't think of you have to write something to publish it or to sell it or anything like that. I just want to encourage people to be creative. It's just a very fun process to to put this down. So I, I hope this gave people some ideas and they actually sit down and just do something. Even if it's for them and their friends, mm -hmm. they'll really have a good time. So that's all. Yeah. Everybody do that and then send all your ideas to us and we'll take the best one. <laughs> And then we'll make it a game, and then we'll forget that you exist. No, we wouldn't do that. Got him. We boom, got him. Yeah, I. I mean, I learned a lot. And I like this is. I thought this is super. This is super interesting. So thanks, Vince, for sharing all of your wisdom with the fetus. Okay. You have now squeezed all of my 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 brain juices out of my brain grape. This is all. This is all you're good for. This is it. Is it. Okay. The rest of the day is eating junk food and painting minis. That's my kind of day. That's a good day. Sure. All right. You know, since we're on the topic of games and making games and playing games, Scott, when you play a game, do you most often play on like a game mat? Yes. When I get my semi-annual game of Age of Sigmar in, I am very often playing on some kind of neoprene mat. Well, then this week's sponsor, Warzone Studio, has got you covered semi annually. This family business have been making mats since 2012 and their Amazon storefront has almost entirely five-star reviews. Battle mats come in a variety of sizes such as 6x4, 3x3, and many others and are double-sided so you get more bang for your battle mat buck. Additionally, according to Warzone Studio, they were making battle mats before they were even called that. Originally, they were called portable battle boards and they were manufacturing them back in 2012. They can produce final mats up to 50 meters in length. So when you're playing that five-week-long apocalypse game, Warzone Studios has the hookup. In addition to battle mats, they also sell 3D prints of a large range of legally licensed and acquired STLs made by other Patreon campaigns. Finally, I never have to use my 3D printer again, which is mostly broken anyway, because I could just have Warzone Studios print, assemble, and prime those 3D prints and then just mail them out to me. You can find links to their Amazon web store and their website down in the description or show notes below. Shout out to Warzone Studio for sponsoring this portion of today's episode. Now on to the newsy news. There is one important bit of news I think we need to start with, and Vince has a bit of news. In case you guys haven't heard, Vince, what's the most important bit of news you want to talk about? Is it his birthday? Is it the launch of Space Station Zero? I think it's the launch of Space Station Zero. <laughs> yeah. Just hit that again many times. <laughs> it's a big button, and I like uh, pushing buttons. I didn't say available now uh, in both PDF and print format. The PDF alone is $13. The print and PDF combined, only $18 for 120 pages of, of gaming bucks? goodies. 18 bucks. Competitively priced. Yes, wow. we, we always want to make our games affordable. That's a huge mission statement for Adam and I. Okay. Fantastic. All right. That's Don't all I got for news. Okay. <laughs> um, the Embracer Group, the parent company that owns Dark Horse Comics, Gearbox, THQ, and also one that you probably heard of, Asmodee, um, purchased T Middle Earth Enterprises, the company that owns the rights to most of J.R.R. Tolkien's works. Um, and the CEO, Lars Wingford, is quoted as saying, I am thrilled to see what lies in the future for this IP with Free Mode and Asmodee. As a start within the group, going to going forward, we look, we also look forward to collaborating with both existing and new external licensees of our increasingly stronger IP IP portfolio. And GW would fall under the external licensees part. And this is one thing I've never really understood about IP and stuff. So these guys now own the rights to make miniatures for 
this universe. Does GW have to go through them? No. Yeah, they, they have an existing. They have a contract for the IP. Correct. Within a certain set of bounds. Within a certain set of bounds, and then there's Time, GW does. Yeah. And then there's okay. timelines on that usually, for it to have to re up. Correct. Not only that, but then how much of the universe do you have access to? Yeah. So you get no example, fucking Smeagol. I'm sorry, GW. Yeah. <laughs> no more Smeagol. Like, in general, when, when when these kind of mega IPs are shared out in contracts, um, you'll have rights to certain things but not other things. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, I believe, uh, this is not, this I don't know for sure, but I believe the GW contract covers the Hobbit to the Lord of the Rings time period is what they're allowed to play around with. Um, like, for example, they don't have rights to Unfinished Tales or the Cimmerillion or stuff like that. Oh, so, no. So, you know, they're like the point being they couldn't do. I mean, you say that you say that Cimmerillion, but like Glorfindel just smacking down Balrogs yeah. like it's like it's nothing. I mean, or you yeah, think Sauron is bad that's guy. A good, that's a good point. That's a good point. I they're they're so like tapped like. That turnip has, has no more juice for them to squeeze for their product <laughs> range right now. Whereas clearly, like when Amazon acquired the rights for the upcoming like Rings of yes. Power, you know that's dealing with Second Age stuff, right? Yes, like early Second Age, Numenor, and all that. So, so yeah, you can you can get different time periods and things like that. They you know they can chop up these licenses however they want. I mean, it's just a contract. It's just paper. It's just <laughs> words written by humans. It can say anything. Yeah. So I, I guess it's just maybe just shifting of the rings of power who has the power over, <laughs> nice. over Tolkien's estate and all the properties. Um, interestingly enough, though, that I found is that Asmodee is a company underneath this umbrella yeah. that has a direct stake in this line of products, meaning direct competitor in theory to a, somebody like a Games Workshop because they do games, they do miniatures, they do tabletop and board game stuff. So it's interesting to see that. It's not like, well, we are the company that owns all this doesn't have anybody underneath us to do that. We're just going to keep shilling it out for just the, the money coming in each year for you to make the thing for us. But mm. if we could do it in-house, they might. Yeah, the most interesting that. thing to me, honestly, like would just be get it out of the time period of the War of the Ring. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, we got it. <laughs> got him understood like there's yep know what happened there you know i i played the lord of the rings online for years and years and years i have like a lifetime subscription i have oh, you're one of those huh max level characters or whatever you, you know. do something other than advancing not your years. mini painting empire not for years but okay. but i did like for a long time i mean i invested a huge amount of time in that game and that was set during the war of the ring and you you interact and in, and in sort of entwine with the main characters in the story and with the main storyline and it goes in and explores a lot of corners and stuff and it does it really well but you know there's it's a bigger world there's a lot more going on there's a lot more places we could go explore and things we could see it's i mean it's star warsy <laughs> because i don't care about the skywalkers anymore but when mandalorian came on i was like yeah okay let's now I'm in. I'm back on board, right? Because we got some other mm. interesting corner of the universe being explored, right? Mm. So th the point is there's more corners to the world that's actually like poke around in those. Okay. If I take one step more, I'll be, be the, the furthest from, from home I've ever been. I've ever been. <laughs> um, all right, moving on. Uh, Warcrow the Fantasy and by Corvus Belly, uh, who, Mick Infinity. They have a release date now for their, uh, I think, I don't know if this is for the board game or for the miniature war game. Uh, but it has release date in October. Is that what I saw? Well, that's coming up quick. I hit a link and it brought me to Games Workshop. Um, Oopies. That's not what we want. Um, yeah, October 18th. It's going to be kickstarted. Um, do you ever play Infinity? Wait, it's oh. going to be kickstarted? Are you joking? Of course it is. So it's not going to actually come out then. It'll come oh, out like a no. year after that? Yeah, probably. Oof. <sighs> Boy, we live in a dystopian reality. Um, <laughs> yeah, great. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've played Infinity. Yeah. Yeah. So that this I believe this is the the campaign referring to the dungeon crawling board game version of Warcrow. It also has a skirmish version. It might have both, honestly, in the campaign. I'm not gonna sit here and read this entire article right now. Um, but if you were looking forward to that, it is coming out soon. Cool. All right, Vince, I have something I want to talk to you about and the news seems like the right time to do it. I'm ready. <laughs> so there's a new vampire model. You may have heard about this for Age of Sigmar, the best vampire model they've ever made. That's not true. Um 
I'll fight you. I will uh, fight you too. Uh, He's amazing. It is being released with a goddamn book. Uh-huh. Like you have to buy the book to sure. get the model. He's a black library character. It's him and the the. Uh, the Thunderstore Stuckerbuck. Yeah. Yes. He's also there. Stuckerbuck? Thundermore Stuckerbuck. And, yeah. This guy's name is fucking. Yeah, but can't I just buy the damn model? No. I mean, with a book is a. Look, they want to sell books, but I don't know what to tell you. Welcome to products, I guess. Like, welcome to capitalism, John. Is this your first day? I mean, uh, like. Have you heard of a, uh, a wee man called Gotrek? Sure. He had a model and a book, and I didn't have to buy a goddamn book to buy Gotrek. I don't know that it's actually that much more expensive than how they tend to sell the characters individually. Mm. What is I feel like there doesn't need to be so many trees cut down for these shitty novels. Is all I'm saying. Whoa! Nobody is going to nobody going to read these things because they're just going to have the awesome ass vampire. Right? I mean, I I would definitely read this book. Um, I but I always read fantasy vampire books. Though. I'll read it. I'm just mad that I have to. <laughs> uh, my honest answer is sure. We it'd be really nice to just. <laughs> my be able honest to... answer is sure. Yeah. Just leave it at that, Vince. That says it all, right? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was just joking. You can keep talking. No, I was gonna say like I would very much like to just buy the model by itself, but it's I, I guess it's better than having to buy a, a dual FOMO box to get mm, with the whole army just to get the one hero. Good I want, point. So. Yeah, good but you point. okay? I can say this because I had to paint the Zinch dude. Each of the heroes, the little Zinch guy, mm-hmm. the Chrysling, and then the new Lumineth one, they're on the single tiny sprue in that box. That is the single sprue hero. Yeah, because they always do eventually release they, them alone. Now. Usually, it's like quite a while later. They've been speeding it up, so it's usually about uh, three to six months now. Because that um, the new uh, Skaven dude, he's coming out already. Yeah, and that's not been that long. So right. mm. Wait, let's do it. Let's do a lightning round news session. Okay, Vince wants to do a lightning round news session. I'm going to hit a bullet point, and then John's going to hit one. Wizkid announces new Dragonlance miniatures with Dragonlance upcoming return to the tabletop. Wizkid is releasing a Icons of the Realm set. I don't know what that means, but if you're into Wizkids and you're into Dragonlance miniatures, uh, I don't know. Dragonlance is awesome. The War of the Lance is where this new book is set. Uh, did you did you read the books when you were? Of course I did. Of course we all did. Uh, when did those books come out? When I was a fetus. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Now see, now you're on point. The very the very first fantasy book, the first my first introduction to anything fantasy was in the th- fourth grade. I read Legend of Huma. That was my. I love Legend of yeah. The Legend. I always said Huma, but I. Me too. But then I felt. But then people always said Huma around me. I was like. This is weird. Yeah, but like Kaz and Huma, like yes. that's, I love it. Again, perfect. Yes. Perfect. So super excited. Hope the minis are good. Okay. This is a little thing. We're gonna, As part of this rapid fire, Vince has to do a two-sentence reaction to the, to the information. Okay, I'm ready. Go. Rivet Wars Reloaded drops on Kickstarter September 6th, promising new faction, mechanics, and more. Two sentences to go. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> New AOS Battle Box Arcane Cataclysm featuring Zinch and Lumineth Realm Lords. Uh, both of the heroes are awesome. I don't care about the rest of the figs. Yeah. Why is her staff so thick? Cron uh, Spine Incarnate of Gur up for pre order. Looks like some sort of goat dragon skeleton thing. Actually, that is the, uh, the terrain that was in the, the new arcane yes, box. Yes, I have to go get our food. Okay. Our food is here. Oh, Ten minutes we, early, those sons of bitches. We fucked up. <laughs> right. Welcome to the end of the podcast. Thank you for hanging out all the way to the end. Vince, thank you for being a guest and tolerating our bullshit and sharing your wisdom with us. We really appreciate you. Oh, nonsense. No no, no BS at all. You guys are awesome. I would spend. I would do a seven-hour version of this if you wanted and hang out. Do not put day. that in the universe because John will then guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> I, make a lot of, I make a lot of Billy Mays guarantees. <laughs> I just slap it on a big old fish tank and be like, it's never going to (laughs) break. If you guys like this podcast and you want to support it, there are many ways to do it, both free and not free. Some free ways are whitelisting our channel so you can see our ads. We run every 30 minutes. You can tell your nerd friends about our podcast. You can give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. And if you have some cash you want to throw around, you can buy some of our merch. Link down there in our Teespring store. Or you can become, become a patron where you get access to an extended episode. We're talking about things like new stuff we've tried out. We give feedback to patrons. And we also talk about models that we love from other artists in the last two weeks. Um, also, as being a patron, you get access to giving us topic ideas and also models for critique. 
But yeah, all the ways you can support the podcast. Isn't he pretty good at that whole shilling thing? It's really good. It's like he's been doing it all his life. All my life. I was born to shill, baby. Born to shill. I was like, Daddy, I don't want a real job. I want a shill, Daddy. I didn't want a shill. <laughs> Uh, it's, it, speaking of uh, supporting artists, we have an artist between Scott and I, not actually Scott and I, and you should support him and the wonderful Uncle Adam from Tabletop Minions in their new game, Space Station Zero. For a mere $13, you get the PDF, or $18 for the in-paper copy, so, you know... With the PDF. The, it, it, with the PDF, because, oh, your life. you know, the government can take away your PDFs, but they can't take away your paper. So, thanks, Vince. Thanks, your for, book back. Thanks, thanks for giving a solution for dealing with our government. That's what I'm here for. That's that's generally my main purpose. Yeah. <laughs> We're all going to watch VHS tapes at Vince's after this because the government can't take them from him. That's right. <laughs> it's just the Goonies and Mac and me all the way down. <laughs> Mac and me. <laughs> Fucking Mac oh, that's and a, me. That's a, that's a deep cut there. All right. Until next time, we will catch you on the Lippity Flop.